And welcome to the environmental security uh, workshop of this um, UN 75th anniversary festival, following close on the heels of last night's food security workshop, to which, of course, it's intimately related. Now, that little bit of animation really tells you what uh, our organization, Peace Child, is all about. It's about empowering young people to grab the wheel from rogue and reckless governments that threaten to drive humanity over the edge of the cliff and turn it around and drive towards the sunlit uplands of sustainability. And that's where we're hoping to go tonight. But let's just think about those three things that come up at the end. Protect people. Well, we have to do that because poverty is probably the biggest enemy of uh, in the environment. Uh, if a person has to choose between saving their child and saving a forest, they'll always choose their child. And celebrate differences. We have to treat every stranger as a friend we haven't met yet. We have to get along. That's what humanity is quite good at doing. And certainly young people that I've worked with in Peace Child are very good at doing. And probably most important, we have to unite nations. We haven't got time for these trade wars, physical wars, rearmament, arms races, that kind of thing. Totally destructive. So if we do those three things, we have a fighting chance of saving life. And that's what we're looking at tonight. And we're blessed um, with a wonderful intergenerational panel, which is what Peace Child has been doing these last 40 odd years, bringing together the energy and vision and idealism of young people with the experience and wisdom of older people who've been around the block a few times. And of those older people on our panel, we have Jonathan Porritt and Mark Linus, elder statesmen of environmental activism here in the UK for many, many years. Uh, we also have Bart Ulstein and Karen Eng, who were the uh, founders and creators and editors and promoters of the UN Environment Programs Environment Magazine, Tunza, for many, many years. On the youth side, we have Lauren Bannum from Wheatumstead in Hertfordshire. We hope we'll have Ella Donnelly, uh, a young uh, extremist rebellion activist and also an actress. Um, we have Abigail Wordsworth from Yorkshire, and we have Flora Griffiths, and we have uh, Estelle Marsh, our um, rapporteur. We're going to have breakout rooms halfway through. Uh, you'll, you'll see how that works. We could run through a laundry list of issues that we're going to um, touch on in, in relation to the environment, but we decided to show you... Um, a revised scene from the play Peace Child, which gives our organization its name. Um, it's a TV chat show scene, and in it, uh, a bunch of young people uh, confront some um, oil people, oil uh, magnets, and um, uh, a government minister, and argue with them what needs to happen to the environment. Welcome to our show discussing the issue of environmental security. The UK will host the 26th UN Climate Change Conference in Glasgow, which will usher in what some are calling the most consequential decade in human history. Because they believe that decisions taken in this next decade will determine the future course of human history and, indeed, humanity's very survival. Now, here to argue for that course, to be green, are four young people who will inhabit that future. 
whatever it is. And joining us remotely from his castle in Scotland is Lord Christopher Paisley, Chair of the Oil and Gas Federation and, from Westminster, Energy Minister, Sir Derek Goodman. Everything I've done in politics has been designed to help young people and improve their chances in life. We set up the Green Investment Bank. We built you the best schools. Best schools? Your schools have taught us nothing about climate emergency. Your schools teach us about the Battle of Hastings, which happened a thousand years ago, but nothing about the battle for survival that our generation has to fight right now. With respect, then, may I ask why you appear on a discussion show about this subject when you've learned absolutely nothing about it? We have learned, but we've learned in spite of school, outside of school. I'm sure it comes up in geography, in politics. It's mentioned once or twice, but it's not a major focus. Most of our friends leave school with no clue that a climate and ecological breakdown is even happening. Let alone why. And on hard questions about nuclear versus renewables, we have no clue. Some tell us that French nuclear electricity is half the price of German renewable electricity. Others tell us that in the UK, nuclear is double the price of renewable. We don't know who to believe. Our generation is facing the greatest existential threat humanity has ever faced. And your generation is not even able to tell us the truth about these issues. Truth like the fact that fossil fuels can only ever be a tiny blip in the long history of humanity. Let's go to the slides. This shows that before 1800, all energy was renewable. After 2100, all energy will have to be renewable again, as oil and gas will have run out. All because you guys have failed to stop the inexorable rise of carbon emissions. The Keeling Curve, Sir Derek. Your wonderful schools don't teach us about that. And none of your green investments have made the slightest dent in that upward curve. Well, you're assuming that all global warming is a bad thing. There are disadvantages, I would agree, but global warming brings advantages too. I rather like the idea of champagne produced in Shropshire. Absolutely, Chris. I think we'd all enjoy a bit of Mediterranean sunshine on our British coasts. That's crazy, sir. Flat out delusional. You know the bad results of climate change far outweigh any good that might come of it. Upwards of $30 trillion worth of housing and farmland flooded by sea level rise. Our planet is fast becoming an empty shell that will struggle to support a human family of a billion people, let alone the 10 billion we expect to be here by 2050. Let's just stick to climate change for the moment. What would you like to see the British government and industry bring to the table in Glasgow next year? Very simple support our repeals which are compulsory eco-education for every student at every school every university in the world net zero emissions by 2030 through a green new deal that delivers a 100 percent green renewable sustainable economy that will require a total phasing out of fossil fuels by 2030 which in turn will need laws that criminalise all production, sale and use of fossil fuels. Punishable by lengthy jail terms. Your reaction, gentlemen? Sheer yeah, disbelief. <laughs> what they are proposing is completely unreasonable, unrealistic, impossible, impractical. And certifiably insane. I and my members will fight tooth and nail to ensure that no such lunatic proposals ever reach the table in Glasgow. If you think that we're going to sit back and watch you dismantle the world that we built so carefully, you're much mistaken. But COVID-19's already dismantled that world. We have to build it back, and we're asking you to build it back green. The Green New Deal will create millions of jobs for all of us. Conserve the fisheries, improve farming, eradicate poverty. You can be a pioneer of all of that. Be a hero. Not a dinosaur. So how do I change from dinosaur to hero? Help us create a bright, 
prosperous future for us, our children and our grandchildren. The climate emergency is real. Sir, look at this. Arctic sea ice in 1980, Arctic sea ice now. That's not some ice eating bug munching away the ice cap. That is climate change. You're a businessman. You're both in the business of making profit for yourselves and for our country. If you'd said in the 19th century that you were going to invest in canals and longboats rather than in railways, you'd have lost a fortune. You have to move with the times. Look forwards, not backwards. My members have hundreds of years of experience providing cheap, reliable energy that has powered the greatest transformation humanity has ever seen. And now you green zealots are working to replace our tried and tested energy infrastructure with madcap renewable technologies, which even your own spokesman, Michael Moore, admits doesn't work. It's crazy. You're referring to the film Planet of the Humans, which suggests that many of the green power initiatives you're promoting are not reliable and, in many cases, are not even green. Look, I've seen the film, and unlike many of my fellow Greens, I thought it was a useful wake-up call. We don't know all the answers. But we sure as hell know that we have to look for them. We're your partners. Your majority stakeholders. Logic dictates that we'll have to live with the decisions made in Glasgow a whole lot longer than you will. You'll be dead. Thanks very much. Come with us to Glasgow. Stick with us and let us co-create a Green New Deal that secures our future. Sounds like a plan. Sadly, it's not a plan that I can play any part in. Look, I respect you kids. I really do. You've done your homework and yes, you've scored a few points off me. I admit that. And in my heart of hearts, I'd love to support your energy, your enthusiasm, your idealism, your vision. I know my members. I know their shareholders, the big ones anyway. They'd fire me in a heartbeat if they thought I was remotely sympathetic to any of the things you said tonight. Then what good would I be to you? Likewise. I wish I could, but I can't. There's only so much green crap the British public will put up with, and though some support your ideas, not enough to get us re-elected. Can you at least support our call for carbon taxes? Not if it raises the prices of my members' products. But not if it raises the energy bills of everyone who might vote for me. Look, gentlemen, the science is very clear. To keep global warming anywhere close to the targets your government agreed in Paris, you can only burn around 20% of proven oil reserves. Will you agree to keep those assets you cannot burn in the ground? In the ground? Not in a million years. You have to, if we're to have any kind of future. My shareholders would laugh at me. Will you at least stop investing in looking for any more? Stop upstream prospecting for oil? My directors would think I'd gone soft in the head. No way. Sir Derek, then can't you see? You have to pass laws to stop them. We don't have the votes. So you have to do citizens' assembly? Madness. That removes power from our elected assembly. From parliament. We could never allow that to happen. House of Lords will be right behind you, Derek. So, another non-starter. Seems like we've come to the end of the road. The end of their road, maybe. Either that, or the planet. We now ask uh, each of the uh, elder panelists to choose one part of that uh, that scene, one line, one issue, and um, comment on it, and also challenge uh, the young people who help create that scene uh, with a question, because this is a dialogue, not a lecture. So very shortly, let me first hear from uh, Jonathan. How, which part of that scene would you like to pick up on and comment on? I guess the thing that sort of bugged me most about that was the stereotyping that was going on there. 
And when we actually look at the objections to what young climate activists and Extinction Rebellion are calling for today, they're not being completely pushed away like that. If anything, they're being patronized and occasionally acknowledged. Don't forget that the commitment of the UK government to be a net zero carbon economy by 2050 came as a direct result of campaigning on the streets from uh, young climate activists and from Extinction Rebellion. So my question, my point to uh, uh, colleagues, young colleagues this evening, is what is your view about the nature of campaigning now? Obviously, this changes as the years go by. How do you feel about the sort of campaigning tactics we need? Is it all everybody out in the street now? Or can we still rely a bit on lobbying in the conventional style? Should we go after business? Should we go after politicians? What's your take on the politics of COP26 by next year? Which bit did you choose? Well, I was thinking about the fact that even though young people are in this video appealing to the older generation um, to make changes in policy, I'm also realizing that they're not that many years away from having the reins in their own hands right now. So actually, might it be better for them to be putting themselves in <clears throat> where in a few years' time when they're adults, they'll be making the policy changes and they'll be working in the uh, fields of industry and energy that can make a difference. And I'm wondering, what are you what are you planning right now for your careers and life plans in order to make that happen and make the changes in the world that you would like to see? Well, I was I was struck by the the economic uh, arguments that were going on. Um, I sort of feel that it's easy to dismiss the green economy in the same way as Guinness ads used to say, I've never tried it because I don't like it. Um, not There hasn't been enough work yet done and acceptance of moving towards a green economy for us to um, know how to make it all work. Um, and of course, green taxes would have to be part of the green economy but they don't have to be pernicious. You, you can imagine a system where taxes introduced on environmental bads, pollution, use of fossil fuels, at the same time as they're reduced on goods, and by goods I mean good things, um, which includes labor, which is income tax to you and me. You can imagine a world in which you can balance these two so that, um, that citizens are paying the same amount. But what I'd really like to ask the young people follows on from what Karen was saying, you soon will be there. How do you think we should be energizing the transition towards a great green economy that is, after all, a no-brainer? Um, hi there. Say hello, Rosa, since Rosa's in the shot as well. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so Rose is on the youth panel. I'll turn the computer so that you can only see the elder at this point. Um, so I was quite struck about all of the um, attention that's given to COP26. Obviously, that's happening in the UK. Most of us are in the UK and we're, you know, we've got this huge responsibility to, well, I would say to make it a success, but to make it more than COPs generally are. Um, so this is the big uh, UN climate change meeting. And given that it's going to be in Glasgow, um, many of us who are based in the UK, you know, this is a this is a huge opportunity to to hold our government, which is in the chair, to account to uh, to raise the ambition globally of um, action on climate change. Um, we've got a carbon neutral um, target, zero carbon target in the UK of 2050. That needs to be brought forward, as one of the young people said in the video. Uh, we need to encourage other countries around the world to have zero, adopt zero carbon targets. Um, we need to support the efforts of the poor and those more vulnerable countries. In particular, there's the Climate Vulnerable Forum of nearly 50 developing countries around the world who, whose voices need to be heard as they're, as they're defending the, the Paris goals, in particular, 1.5 degrees. Um, and none of that's going to happen unless we get people people's voices mobilized. Um, people out in the streets, particularly younger people, um, so the question really is what we can all do to make sure that um, that COP26 is is more of a success than uh, these big international meetings tend to be. Okay, thank you very much. So um, 
we have uh, the challenge to the youth panel, who I hope will be able to come up very quickly. But why don't we first go to, to Rosa so that she can be the first to answer the question. So just uh, switch it around, Mark. Yeah, you can stay there with her if you like. Um, Rosa, you've got the, um, the uh, question on the nature of campaign tactics. You've got the question of you're very soon going to be in a position of power, as I'm sure you are in your family already. Um, what are your career plans for, for, for changing things? What do you do, want to do to energize the green economy? And what are you thinking we should do to um, make the COP26 in Glasgow a real turning point event? So choose one of those and then ask your dad or the rest of the elder panel a question. Go. Well, I was um, about my career plans for myself. I mean, I, being an activist is obviously a, a big goal. But um, to be an activist, you have to... Um, really try hard and a lot of work to get uh, into a very high position where you can actually make a massive difference. I mean, things like this are great and um, you can just climb on from here. But um, I think once I come out of school, I definitely want to go further into the environmental things in college, at A level, and uh, university, things like that. I mean, this my generation is the generation who is going to make the most change in climate change. So we, a lot of us are gonna to have to go into environmental jobs to make sure that we don't, as the video showed, the animation showed, go off the edge of the cliff. And, okay. <laughs> Do you have a question? And, yeah, sure. Um, I was think, asking about how, um, what, how we're going to help uh, countries in poverty to, um, to achieve the goals if they're, if it's a cheaper and easier way for them to just mine things out of the ground, how are you going to um, make sure that they have the option to be in uh, climate security? Uh, so, uh, in response to Jonathan's question, uh, I thought that I, I very much agreed with him that uh, a lot of the time the issues are that um, young people are very much patronised uh, in their in the responses they receive from their actions um and i think that whilst we absolutely have to we have to acknowledge the fact that um so much has come from the actions of groups like exile um we also i think need to acknowledge the fact that our government has historically repeatedly failed to um take sufficient action on these issues and so i think that whilst um i someone who uh, studies politics, someone who has held events trying to lobby my local MP, um, had, you know, various contact with politicians. It's, I would absolutely love to say that the way forward is through the current governmental system. But I think with the way, the direction that we need to go in is in educating the public, because anyone who's studied politics to any degree knows that the way we hold our politicians to account is by electing them. And if people who are electing them really care about the environment and really put that first as a priority on who they're voting for, then politicians will have to take action. And so I think it's about educating the public, but also we need to take direct action in order to educate the public, in order to receive media attention, and in order to put pressure on the government even further. So my question to the elder panel would be, why is it, do you think, that previous generations uh, haven't cared as much as possibly they should have or haven't taken as much action as they should have in order to move us along uh, to achieving a sustainable future? Um, well, I agree with Lauren that we really need to start educating people about, especially children, about the environment, because at the end of the day, they're going to be the ones to really galvanise the green economy. Um, and I, I just think it starts with educating young people. And then in response to this, I, I think that we really need to um, start campaigning. So it's all right, like at the moment, Extinction Rebellion is a massive thing, but um, it has been like seen in the news that they caused quite a lot of disruption. So while I think it's a good thing to get media attention, I do think we need to teach children how to campaign and actually lobby for change um, with governments and their local MPs and try and get action that way. 
Um, and my question to everyone would be, um, what do you think the best way to galvanise a green economy would be for the young people of today? Um, so I think it's really important um, to focus, when we talk about climate change, to also focus on um, halting biodiversity loss. Um, I think this should be one of the major aspects of, um, well, interrelated with um, uh, with climate change, because um, it has impacts on community, economy, health, society, the air and water that we breathe and use, um, and also biodiversity is part of the landscape that we enjoy. Um, and um, I also think creating new green jobs is a priority, just as an aside to that. Um, and my question would, to the elders would be, um, do you think the Paris Agreement is currently uh, enough or working well enough? How can we get more people interested in what it is, um, especially in terms of countries that will be affected most, such as developing countries? Um, and I think there's a stop take every five years, but is this enough? Um, do we need to be acting faster with the Paris Agreement? Um, and the temperature goal that they've set is for a maximum of two degrees, but um, do we believe that this needs to be lower? Um, Thank you very much. Um, okay, we're going to hear back from the uh, elders panel. Um, and you've got, uh, you've got some serious questions there. Um, I, I feel that Abigail did raise the issue closest to my heart, and I'd love to hear why um, the elders feel that we have so signally failed to educate this generation in the challenges that we face. Um, that story started with, we created you the best schools, but actually, if the schools um, do not educate uh, this generation about the challenges of creating a green economy, uh, my opinion is that they failed utterly. We've had eco-ed, we've had a decade of environmental education, but basically they haven't laid a glove on the uh, current educational curricula. Uh, so thank you uh, for, for, for raising that. Uh, Lauren asks you directly, why do you think um, this generation has gone 50 years without actually putting a dent in the Keeling curve um, of showing climate uh, emissions? Um, the, they obviously agree about campaigning, but uh, they haven't really answered your question, uh, Jonathan, which, of course, you raise in your book, Open Hell, as to what should be the new approach to campaigning and lobbying. Um, XR have shown us some ways, but I think, you know, one of the things that we need to look at tonight is what we should do uh, in terms of campaigning for the um, COP in, in Glasgow, because... Uh, Flora, um, Flora's question, is the Paris Agreement good enough? Um, does it work fast enough? Um, is a really good one. And I think that, uh, you know, we can raise doubts about that. We have the 2050 target. We've just heard about the Chinese 2060 target for um, zero emissions. Uh, XR, I think, is talking about 2025, 2030 to go zero carbon. Um, what should we be looking at there? And also... Um, you know, the biodiversity loss, is it enough to have those uh, uh, fine words that we heard at the UN last month about biodiversity, or do we need something stronger? Um, in the scene, there is the talk about criminalizing the use of fossil fuels. Um, Mark, in his book, has made a very strong plea that really anything that runs on an internal combustion engine should be banned like yesterday. But Mark, um, maybe you'd like to come back and answer some of the um, questions that young people raise, please. Um, yeah, hi. I was um, particularly wanted to, to speak in agreement with what Flora said about biodiversity needing to be um, considered as part and really uh, absolutely central part of this whole issue. It's an ecological emergency, not just a climate emergency. Um, I've been particularly excited by the issue of rewilding recently. I've been working with a, re a charity in, in the UK called Rewilding Britain. Um, and there was actually a paper that came out in either Science or Nature last week, which showed that if you rewild, I think it's about 20, 30% of the world's existing uh, cropland, you could soak up really hundreds of billions of tons of carbon. So, at the same time as preventing mass extinction. So there's a huge amount we could do, but what's the corollary of that? Well, we've got to produce enough food on less land to continue to feed the world's population, which means changing people's diets, reducing animal consumption, so on and so forth. So 
all of these issues are, ve are very interlinked. Uh, and I think actually Flora again mentioned about COP26. Um, two degrees is it's certainly too high. Um, that's why the vulnerable countries kept 1.5 degrees in the Paris targets. It's going to be incredibly difficult to stay on the 1.5 degree trajectory uh, because of the rate at which emissions are still going up. Um, you mentioned, uh, David, the Keeling curve. That's the, the relentlessly upwards curve of, of carbon concentrations increase, accumulating in the atmosphere. Um, even the COVID lockdown, um, which was, you know, shut, shut everything down for a period of weeks and has reduced economic activity globally and that since February, has reduced emissions by about 7 to 8%. Um, if you were to do that every single year and have a new lockdown every year, you would probably get back on the 1.5 degree. To, um, <laughs> you know, most people don't think that's desirable. So it just goes to show really just how dramatic the transformation w will need to be to, to, to stick even to the 1.5 degree goal, which was agreed at Paris. Mark, can I just raise a question that's come up on the uh, the panel about um, uh, um the Trillion Trees campaign. Do you think there's any value in, in uh, those sorts of campaigns? Uh, I'm skeptical of tree planting as the sort of great big solution. A lot of big corporations, even the Trump administrations, in favor of the Trillion Trees campaign, which means there must be something wrong with it. Um, <laughs> you know, that's why I think rewilding, letting the trees plant themselves in a, in a way which, you know, is, is naturally driven. You get, the, you get a natural species mix rather than the ones that humans want to plant. You know, they're not using plastic tree guards. It's, it, you know, you, we, we need to bring back lost ecological processes and lost species. And that can only be done really by allowing nature to rebound over huge areas rather than just going out there and just, you know, monotonously planting trees. So I'm a bit skeptical, but yes, we need to vastly increase the world's, uh, world's forest cover, not just to reduce the carbon in the atmosphere, but also to, you know, to, to, to safeguard biodiversity. Okay, but. Well, I was just, just leading on from what Marx said, I, I would also um, highlight and, or shout out for regenerative farming because we've tended to demonize farmers, but um, I think things are beginning to change. And um, certainly the work of farmers who are trying to look after the soil and improve the soil gives us a great opportunity to actually use it as a, as a carbon sink. Um, the, the other question that, that was raised um, that, that I think is, is relevant here is why, why have we failed to um, get on with a lot of this? Um, one of the factors involved in it, I think, is the political cycle, that while many of these problems take um, evolve over 15, 20 years, political cycles tend to be between four and seven years. So many politicians have said, oh, I'm not going to worry about that. That's for the next administration. And somehow we have to um, change these that attitude. But in a way, I'm encouraged at the moment because um, I think we're in for a rocky decade now where action will become really urgent and people will really begin to see things that they don't like. And this may, together with action by all sorts of people um, on the streets, um, lobbying, however we do it, politicians will have to confront these issues because life will get significantly tougher in, in, in the 20s. Thank you. Um, yes, I mean, I think the big problem is, uh, as we saw with the Gilets Jaunes, um, the general public doesn't always uh, appreciate the uh, uh, wishes of the environmentalists. But uh, Karen, which of those points would you like to pick up on? Um, I, I also wanted to address what Bart said. Um, you know, the thing is, it's not that nothing has happened in the last several decades. We've been thinking about this for a very long time, um, I think in a very focused way since probably the late 60s. And as a child, I grew up with these issues. And as an adult, I've always thought about these issues. But these are really big ideas for big transformation. And these kinds of values and ideas take generations to percolate up. In the meantime, we've been in a race against populations growing. And as the populations grow, more people are on the earth consuming more things. And um, 
So, you know, when Bart and I were editing Tunza, for example, we did it for about 10 years. At the beginning of the cycle, when we started, when I told people what I did for a living, editing a, a magazine about the environment for young people, I was kind of regarded as a sort of lunatic fringe. You know, it was a fringe subject that only worthy people talked about, and it was sort of a hobby. And as we did it in those 10 years, the subject became more and more in mainstream news, partly because of what Bart's saying, you know, the earth is becoming less comfortable and the, the situation, the crisis is becoming actually more urgent in a way that more people can actually experience. Just with the COVID pandemic, if you haven't experienced the problems firsthand, you're more likely to set it aside and, you know, go on your night holiday or have your McDonald's. So, um, I think the exciting thing about right now is that those everything is now coming to a head. So for those of us who have been watching this be watching this be a, a sleeper subject for so long, it's actually finally happening. It's mainstream news, it is the world that we are living in. And so now that we have your generation here with us uh, helping us fight together, that's actually an incredibly hopeful thing for me. Thank you very much. Jonathan, we have our top upvoted question as how do we transition and shift our human value system away from money, profit and eternal growth and efficient to efficiency and ecosystem functionality? A simple question for you, Jonathan. I know you're up to it. <laughs> Thanks, David. Um, I sort of wanted to focus to start with on some of the questions from our the ones that have just been directly posed to us because Please, yeah. there, there, has, there has to be a bit of background to this. We all know the Paris Agreement is not enough. Even if every country did what it promised to do in Paris, it would take the average temperature increase to more than three degrees centigrade by the end of the century, which is on the way to four, which is on the way to the end of human civilization. So we know that. But I think Abigail raised a really important point, which is we haven't yet galvanized a green economy. And to a certain extent, a green economy is close enough to today's mainstream not to scare the life out of the politicians. And I'm being careful here because obviously politicians are not going to do the great big radical things that we need them to do until they get comfortable with the idea that a green economy will create prosperity, will create jobs, will drive innovation, will make a lot of things happen. And not just in the rich world, Rosa, but in the poor world. One of the most exciting things going on at the moment is the degree to which these new renewable energy technologies, particularly solar and wind, are making a massive difference in developing countries, developing and emerging countries, poorer countries, particularly off-grid solar in India is, a, is an extraordinary story that I haven't got time to go into here. But I suppose that it was Lauren's question that, that relates to what you said, David, which is why haven't we done enough? And I think we haven't done enough because we haven't shifted the values of people. We've tried to make these environmental arguments work at a time when an awful lot of people were either ignorant or indifferent as to the state of the planet. We tried to do it during a period of capitalism, which was almost uniquely vicious in terms of extracting wealth from people, communities, and of course, the planet. And we, try to do it in such a way as not to engage people in deeper issues about the meaning of life and values and the relationship between ourselves and the natural world, et cetera, et cetera. So it is that values dimension now, which I think is going to come to the fore because you can't just argue this from a technocratic, technological point of view. We have to dig deep into what it is that makes life special for human beings and all human beings because we are, of course, talking about a just transition for the whole of humankind. <coughs> Hi. Hi, Ella. Hello. Did you hear Jonathan's um, brilliant uh, statement there? Would you I like do. to react as a young person and Extinction Rebellion activist to how we shift values? Because capitalism, Jonathan wrote a book, uh, Capitalism as Though the Environment Matters, or something of that kind. Um, so it is, it is something that, that obviously we thought a lot about. A capitalism that's ignorant and indifferent to the environment is something that we have to change. And do you feel that your generation is driven by um, values that uh, can actually address those challenges? 
Absolutely. I think more so than um, previous generations anyway. But I think you're absolutely right. It is. It's, it's a change of value that we need to create. And I think what um, a lot of us youth are finding now is actually our values are shifting because we've been born into a world that's already like this and we have to fix it immediately. Um, whereas I find actually it's, it's more my parents' generation that I have to find realigning their values. So I think there's, there's definitely a bit of a divide in the generations and the approach in which we try and change those values is really going to differ um, depending on sort of yeah, what political views are as well, which we know is um, very different in comparison to um, the elder generation and the younger generation. Um, I think in terms of, um, well, political activism and the next steps of political activism, which I know was, um, was raised as well, I think it's going to be really important to um, try and get everybody as politically engaged as possible and actually open this up to as many people as possible because a lot of a lot of people aren't actually sure what their values are going to mean for the for the earth and then how we're going to be able to target that so i know we've been talking about just encouraging people to be more politically engaged to contact their um their mps to give people a voice and understand that they can actually change it and it's not just this huge system that's completely out of our control and we can only vote once every four years it's definitely something that we can take control of and influence and it's going to be a gradual thing but um yeah i think we really really need to push everybody in, in terms of their responsibility and feeling like they can own their decisions and how changing their values and morals can actually push for a better future for us all Okay, um, one thing that uh, was raised in the scene, which I know we um, discussed when we had our run through earlier, uh, was the issue of nuclear power. And um, I know Rosa was um, actually in favor of having it. And actually, we have quite a large audience now. We have about 90 people on the, uh, uh, listening to us. So we will go for a poll on this question of do we need nuclear power? And can we hear from you, Rosa, why you think we do? Yeah. Um, well, I think we do because uh, renewables are all well and good and they're very good for the environment, I admit. But um, I don't think they're a long term plan. I think that they're very good for a short term uh, when, you're, when you're trying to get out of uh, just barreling towards six degrees increase. But um, I, I think that nuclear is a long term way of getting energy and it takes longer to build nuclear power stations, but in the end, it produces more uh, energy for less amount of money. And therefore, it is um, better than renewables in the long term run. And it um, it just it, uh, it's actually a lot less dangerous than people think, because the word nuclear instantly scares people off. As soon as they hear nuclear, they think of nuclear bombs and all these terrible things like Chernobyl. But um, we have much better technology than we did before and it's a lot more safe than people assume it is now. So okay, jo Jonathan, can you tell, I mean, also, uh, nuclear energy is supposedly cheaper in France than uh, the uh, renewably powered energy um, from Germany, and it's green, it doesn't pollute. So, Jonathan, why do you argue strongly that we should uh, banish nuclear from our minds completely? I'm sorry to say that Rosa's incorrect on a number of points in terms of the costings for this. And the reason for that is that even if nuclear power is working well, and often it doesn't, you still have to pay for the fuel that you need, the uranium, whereas your renewables, once they're installed and up and running, and of course costs continue to come down year by year, as we know, roughly 7% per annum reduction in renewables. Once you've got your solar and wind installations there, then you pay nothing for the sunshine and you pay nothing for the wind. There is literally no question that renewables are much, much cheaper than nuclear. There's no remaining question about that whatsoever. That doesn't mean to say it completely rules out a case for nuclear. But the thing I'd like to share with our young panelists this evening is the legacy issue. We've had nuclear power in this country for many decades. You probably don't know that every year 
we have to pay somewhere between 2.5 and 3 billion pounds a year to deal with the waste that this nuclear industry creates. And we still don't really know what to do with it. Now, we'll go on paying 2.5 billion every year indefinitely into the future. And if we have another nuclear program, we'll have another X billion pounds a year to deal with the nuclear waste issue. This is a this is a real legacy concern for me. How does one generation dare to impose on the next generation bills of this kind, which are absolutely enormous, as well as the risks associated with the storage of that nuclear waste, which again, I haven't got time to go into tonight. So I'm, I suppose the reason why I'm so strongly opposed to nuclear power is I feel it is unjust from an intergenerational perspective. It is one generation getting a benefit at the expense of every single generation that comes after. Thank you very much, Jonathan. We'll hear from Mark um, about why you, you would uh, contest that. But then I think um, in, in good Who Wants to Be a Millionaire tradition, we'll ask our audience what they feel. So, Mark, just, just um, reinforce the case that your daughter made. <laughs> yeah, you can t- I haven't coached her, actually. We haven't, I don't think we've even discussed this. So, um, Rosa's come to her own views. Uh, it's not that we're an entirely pro-nuclear household. Um, I used to agree with um, Jonathan, and I used to be anti-nuclear because as an environmentalist, I was sort of brought up that way, and it's sort of in your DNA. And I, I changed my mind really when I first understood the, gra- the magnitude of the climate change emergency. You know, I wrote a book called Six Degrees back in 2007, which I've just updated, and the title of this one is Our Final Warning. And it really is our final warning. We won't have we won't have the luxury of arguing over nuclear legacies in 10,000 years if we don't even get through this century. And we're facing a situation where large parts of the most populated areas of the planet will be left uninhabitable because of simply the magnitude of warming of if we're heading into the three, four degree world, which we will do if we start spurning zero carbon sources of immense sources of uh, opportunities for, for generating zero carbon power, which is what nuclear represents. Um, I'm not arguing that it's the whole solution. I think a nuclear renewables, hydrogen, we're going to need an all of the above strategy to, to try to get through this emergency as quickly and as uh, in, in as good ecological shape as we can. Most of what you hear about nuclear is mythological. Um, the, the fears of radiation and waste and all, all, those, all those are solvable problems and which are, to be honest, completely trivial compared to the gravity of the climate change emergency that we're currently in. Thank you very much, Mark. Now, Damien, uh, can we go to a poll and ask the audience and uh, the panelists, do we need nuclear power? Um, I I, I hope you can um, run that poll right now, Um, Damien. Panelists can't vote, sadly. (laughs) But while that's going on... um, Let's hear from um, Lauren about any of the other issues or questions that have come up on the on the uh, uh, question panel there and what you how you react to to the issues that have been raised so far and whether you feel that your question has been answered about why our generation has failed. Mm. Well, thank you all for um, for your responses to that. And I, I have to say that those are absolutely uh, I, I 100% agree with the things people were saying, especially um, Karen's point about how um, the big ideas take generations to implement. Um, and I think the thing that I would want to focus on most is this idea that's been brought up repeatedly that people are hesitant to take action on things that they don't influence them, that don't impact them firsthand. I think that's something that I've noticed massively um, in my life, that people who who assume that uh, the the costs of climate change and the, and, the, and the climate and ecological emergency on them are um, outweighed by the fact that, you know, it's not really making a difference to them and they don't want to change their diet and they don't want to stop driving their forecasts. Um, so I think for me, my priority, again, would be educating people on the impact of the climate and ecological crisis to everyone all around the world. We know that the climate and ecological crisis disproportionately affects women. It disproportionately affects people of colour. And so my uh, response to all of these fantastic answers about why you think your generation uh, and the generations before my generation have failed to take action, um, to that I would kind of, I would ask how is it that we 
that we educate people on an issue that might not directly impact them in the same way it will impact others? Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Karen Ng. I'm um, formerly the editor of Tunza UNEP's magazine for youth about the environment. And this is Abigail Wordsworth. Hi. Yes. Welcome to our breakout panel. Um, this workshop was originally going to be about individual action, but we've been hearing the phrase for decades now. And um, frankly, if, you know, turning off the lights and, you know, eating the right diet we're going to work, we wouldn't all be here together right now at this very urgent moment. So, um, so Abigail and I decided that the time has come to throw our imaginations at the problem. And we want to come up with some ideas, insights, examples of what you've seen in your life um, in creative creativity and conservation. Um, so we'd like to come out of this workshop with a list that we're going to take back. And so I'm going to put a question in the questions panel. And the questions are going to be, what are the most inspiring creative conservation solutions that you've seen or maybe that you've initiated yourself? And how and why should we apply creativity to conservation and the fight against climate change? Um, if you have any questions or comments, please put them in the questions box and not the chat box. I'm going to go ahead and click those in there. We're going to monitor that questions box so that we can have a conversation about this stuff. And hopefully by the end of the workshop, we'll have some stuff to bring back to the main panel. Um, so I, to introduce myself, I'm an American writer and artist, and I live in the UK. And as a writer, I've spent decades telling the stories of remarkable people who apply incredible imagination to solve environmental problems and improve life wherever they happen to be. And as an artist, a lot of my focus is on environmental issues too. So I'm producing a family-friendly public art project with climate change themes here in my town of Kings Lynn. Um, I'm making art to sell in support of conservation organizations and so on. And Abigail, would you like to introduce yourself a little bit? Hi, I'm Abigail. I'm a student um, in South Yorkshire. And I'm currently doing a um, geography A level and I plan to go to university and do a geography degree. So I'm very passionate about the environment. And um, throughout lockdown, I've been working on a campaign called News to Reuse, which I founded um, to try and get fast fashion on the UK school curriculum, because it's not something that's taught at the moment. So this will be the perfect opportunity to talk about creative action, because a lot of creativity is to do with fashion. So I'm excited to talk about that. Great. So, yeah, thinking about this theme, Abigail and I talked about coming up with various examples of inspiring projects um, having to do with creativity and conservation. So we both have come up with lists that would take forever to share. Um, at some point, I'm going to post a list of links at the bottom so that you could do some exploring. But I also last week, I went to um, a meeting of Culture Declares Emergency. Uh, which is an organization that brings together cultural creators to talk about uh, the climate emergency. And at that meeting, I saw some young people. Um, their organization is called REPEAT, R-E-P-E-A-T. And they are a new youth-led collective that's trying to get people and governments to consider PEAT's role in carbon emissions, but also holistically the role that the peatlands play in our lives here in the UK. So um, what they were presenting at this meeting was this really beautiful zine anthology. It's a collection of art and poems, letters, and more that demonstrate the values of peatlands in Europe and beyond. So I want to bring on with us Frankie Turk and Bethany Copsey of Repeat on stage with us, if that's okay, Paul, so that we can just ask them some questions about their work. Oh, oh yeah. Hi, hey. Paul. Are you guys actually together? We're together, yeah. <laughs> yes, that makes sense. <laughs> but your face is fine under the regulations, I suppose. <laughs> your face is in the middle because oh. we can really see wall. There you are. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> nice to see you again. Yes, you Thank too. You. Thanks Thank for having you. us. Thank you for joining us. So, yeah, I just wanted to ask you a few questions so people can get an idea of your work. I'm going to post a link so that people can go to explore the zine and also to your website so they know what you're going to be up to. 
um, so you all have to take my word for it that it's a really beautiful publication and it's all it's available as an e-zine so no trees were harmed in the publication that was <laughs> the zine um, so yeah just tell us briefly why you're interested in peat and its role in climate change maybe you could start with the how we formed yeah, yeah. we can we can do a little uh, brief introduction so we basically the two of us were on an excursion to a peatland and both having had not a lot of experience with peatlands in the past. And we're given all of this crazy information about the role peatlands have in the climate and ecological crisis. So things like that it is only 3% of the land surface area, but that 6% of global anthropogenic carbon emissions are coming from drained peatlands. So these figures that we thought, well, we surely should have heard about this before now. Um, so we just decided to start making some conversations around that and start talking about it to try and make more people aware, people like us who really were not as aware as we should have been perhaps. Um, so we started doing that. And then as we got deeper into the peat in a kind of <laughs> <laughs> literal way, I suppose as well, um, we also found that they have these really incredible qualities beyond the carbon and the ecological um, provisions in terms of their literary value, if you look at poets such as Seamus Heaney and what uh, Pete has meant to the sovereignty of Ireland, for example, and how it's expressed in his poetry, but also art and, and other forms of creativity that have this relationship with Pete. Um, because it's kind of like this amazing uh, in-between space. And I think this is also like a lot of the conversations that we were having before, which is how do we make this value shift? How mm -hmm. do we right now in this moment kind of have do this kind of almost spiritual or kind of uh yeah some we have to kind of real really imagine things like really train this skill of imagining and i think that peatlands because they're sort of not soil not uh not water not kind of dead not kind of alive um they're sort of this space that mm. that allows you to kind of Put your imagination like get your imagination um flowing um and to talk about lots of different issues like there there seem to be like since we've kind of been getting into the subject we've it's like a you're drawing all these strings from different uh disciplines and from different kind of areas of life like um connecting kind of uh yeah for example like literature with science with um archaeology history geography um and yeah there's sort of these like meeting points almost where conversations can be can be made um and super valuable in terms of ec ecological and climate climate especially um peatlands are one of the most underrated <laughs> ecosystems of the world um so that's kind of where we started from um and then a bit about the peat anthology um I just wanted to say that the, also the, the scientist who first took us on this excursion, he one of the things that kind of triggered us was that he spoke about the EU and, and the subsidies that the EU give to farmers now um, or up until now, um, which basically like they subsidize farmers to drain peatlands. And when you drain peatlands, they have all these negative effects. When you have healthy peatlands, they have all these positive effects. Um, so it's like, so just to make sure everyone knows that because peat, peatlands are a carbon sink, mm -hmm. yeah. and, have, um, and when you disturb it, all the all the emissions come out into the atmosphere. Is that right? And yeah. So a peatland is basically um, a mass of semi decomposed plant matter that's um, not decomposed because it's in stagnant water, um, and so the water becomes kind of acidic and low oxygen. Um, and that's like creates a very special special um, kind of environment um, where you get these mosses forming that over uh, hundreds to thousands of years, sometimes tens of thousand years, um, you have these layers of, of plant matter that build up. So in that sense, it's they are uh, extremely, extremely efficient carbon sinks, but over periods of very long time. Yeah. But it like what's currently stored in carbon now is the largest terrestrial carbon store. And it's, in fact, more than all of the others put together. So we have this massive carbon storage capacity in peatlands. Um, and it's just all underneath our feet in various places. So, yeah, it's huge, Yeah, in fact. But, yeah. So then to hear that the EU, to learn all this, 
And then to hear that the EU subsidizes farmers to drain the peatlands. And when you drain them, basically what happens is the top layer of the organic matter then reoxidizes. And then when it reoxidizes, it starts to uh, emit the carbon into, because it de decomposes and then it um, starts to be readmitted into the air. Um, and and then and we were kind of yeah so we were kind of like stuck on this idea of, of the EU where we like most of us are from and we're like this is crazy policy you know <laughs> um, and and then so we researched we started research researching into um, European politics and the common agricultural policy which is accounts for like forty percent of EU funding just a massive amount of like chunk of EU budget goes into this agricultural policy um, and and we got in contact with some uh, NGOs that are also working on um, on the way that peatlands should be incorporated into the cap um, and we yeah so basically maybe you can talk about that policy a bit. yeah so basically a lot of scientists and a lot of policy makers there is discussion in these kind of niche areas and they put forth a policy paper advising the cap to put more provisions in place to support farmers to not drain their land to pursue polluted culture for example which is wet agriculture and various other ones that were maybe designed more at rural um, development and community engagement these kind of policies and we read this pro uh, policy paper and then we thought okay this is really great and how do we now contribute towards that and I think that was one of the things that we've always tried to stick with with Repeat was um, we feel very strongly about the creative engagement and how that kind of can, can ignite something in people that they feel very passionate towards. And we wanted to contribute to this lobbying effort or this advocacy effort by, con by in a creative means, playing, like bringing into the story, yes, yeah, storytelling, narrative, personal accounts to try and yeah, create a very well-rounded advocacy. And yeah. the anthology has um, contributions, I think, by scientists and artists and art gallery owners and young people, people across generations, and it has all different kinds of voices in there. Why did you feel like it was important to um, have, have all such a wide variety of people and make a zine and why did, and since you're trying to influence policy why did you want it to put it in such a beautiful artistic package what can that do that just uh standing in front with a sign or writing a newspaper article can't do yeah i, I think it's something about it going deeper it feels like you know that when somebody can sit with this document and yeah they probably don't read it all in one go and they probably maybe come back to it or they see it for the first time and then it gets, maybe plants a seed but nothing further happens but hopefully over time this this form of advocacy this that goes a bit deeper that people come back to they reflect upon their own relationships through reading other people's um we hope that it kind of leads to more um yeah policies that are more deep-seated and long-lasting um through this kind of endeavor i suppose um right so it's more it's more um it becomes more organic rather than just reactive to someone bothering you about the issue it, it really takes you into the heart of why we care as human beings about this particular environment but well, yeah i think so but also i wanted to add that like obviously we don't know uh we don't know who, which MEPs are reading this and we don't know, we're never going to know what the result of it is. But I think that there's something also nice about the fact that during the whole process, so you have, you know, 50 people all reflecting on how they value peatlands. Then as you share it around and as you talk about it, we're talking about it now, it's opening up, uh, it's it's drawing attention again and again and again to, to people valuing this ecosystem and all the different ways and all the different experiences that of people are valuing it. So I think it has such a different kind of uh, like life to this policy document, which was made by these NGOs, has all the facts, is really directed at the MEPs, mm -hmm. will go to the, will kind of, um, kind of end at the decision of the cap or, you know, it's still there and it's still valuable information, but um, yeah, it has a different kind of, um, life. lifespan, yeah, 
it um it kind of is like we were talking about in the main panel, isn't it? That where I said what we think these values that human humanity's values as a collective takes generations to change. And sometimes we have these really big crises that forces change, whether we like it or not, like the one that we're in now. But for the most part, if we're all sort of rolling along, it's these sort of moments with art and poems and books that sort of makes us think a little bit more deeply and have those moments that create insight that might then change our behavior that will help us create positive change. Yeah, I think so as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, Okay, we have a question coming in, but I'm not entirely sure if it's for you. Do we need different approaches for different generations to, to inspire changes in behavior or can we create stronger bonds mm -hmm. between generations to change collective behaviors? We were talking about this in, that, in the other meeting that we were in, weren't we? Um, is there a role for creativity? Um, is there a role for creativity reinvigorate, re, for example, reinvigorating make, do and mend? which is actually something we can talk about with Abigail's project. But um, yeah, do you guys want to talk about the, in, the intergenerational aspect of your creative work? Yeah, I think we can speak a little bit to it because I think, yeah, we, we are primarily youth in the group and it's it's actually my birthday today and I realize I'm, I'm kind of exiting that youth. Yes, I know. <laughs> I'm paradigm at some stage. But um, yeah, so we are primarily youth and we were very kind of, aware of that being one of our strengths I think speaking to a lot of the things that were brought up in the main panel before in terms of perhaps being more aware of intersectionality and those things that some generations I think haven't been exposed to in the same ways even uh, and so whilst being very aware of that we also realized that I think one of the biggest failures I think at the moment in our dealing with these things is the lack of intergenerational communication. And our societies are quite fragmented, I think, within ages. Even if you look at your school year, it would be weird if you were friends with someone who was a year above. I remember this kind of notion. And I think we kind of need to foster these relationships a lot more because we can learn a lot from people who've spent 40 years working in this field, but they can learn a lot more about having a fresh perspective, for example. And so I think that's something for me, I think is really vital when it comes to change. Um, and also a less polarizing, I think, in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. um, and in terms of how to do it, I, I guess just, yeah, for us, it was just starting to interact with a lot of different people who cared about Pete and that brought in a lot of different ages, of course. So mm -hmm. you know, our situation, I suppose. Yeah. Um, Ab before we let you go to celebrate your birthday, Abigail, did you have <laughs> an insight that you wanted to um, bring Frankie and Bethany? I was just going to say, like, it seemed like an amazing initiative. And I think it's great how, you know, you've got an issue that not many people probably know about because, I mean, I've learned about Pete in geography, but maybe other people haven't. So I think it's great how you've got um, an issue with, you know, the carbon store and you've actually made it creative and kind of accessible to everyone. So it's, it's more engaging. And I think that's a big thing with... Um, these environmental issues, they need to be engaging and we need people to use their creativity in a way that helps the environment. And I think that's, a, I think it's just great what you're doing. Thank you. I, I wanted to add to that as well, because I think that peatlands are also very like, in terms of what you're saying is also a very specific case because they've for a very long been kind of uh, pushed aside as sort of wastelands. Um, they've kind of, they had a bit of a, they have quite a bad reputation as, as an ecosystem. You say like, oh, I'm feeling a bit bogged down. Like I'm feeling like low energy or I'm feeling like there's a lot of kind of puns and, and, uh, kind of you, cultural references of bogs being this kind of negative place. Mm -hmm. so I think that more than anything, like it's like that kind of made us think, wow, we really need to kind of change this whole paradigm of like how people see this ecosystem. Maybe, for example, forests don't have this. Like everyone knows that forests are great, you know, like <laughs> <laughs> they've got a really good rep. Um, so maybe it's not so apparent that you need to kind of be really creative with forests because people are already kind of cap their, their imagine is, imagination is already kind of uh, there they, yeah. they can walk through a forest you know whereas a bog is kind of like 
you're like in the bog but like with wellies and it's raining and there's like mosquitoes and it's just like oh um so well, it's actually more romantic than you would think i actually live in a, place, <laughs> I live in a very boggy area i live in the Fen fenlands so, so nice. yeah, yeah exactly. exactly terrible reputation but actually i find it very romantic yeah. yeah no and i and i've spoken to a lot of people that are like i love going to the bog and it's the most amazing thing and and we know uh, a photographer who is an Irish photographer and she takes these amazing photos of bogs of like very, very close up because the thing with bogs is that you don't notice how beautiful they are until you like go very close or you go very far. Mm. So like they have a very weird like kind of optical trickery to them as well. Um, but yeah, they have a bad reputation. So <laughs> I think that's like a, definitely where like where we were where we were starting so yeah that's really fascinating and yeah i'm i put the link in the question box so anybody who's watching can follow follow and go grab it and learn more about repeat on their website so thank you guys so much for coming thank you. and thank you us. and happy birthday thank you for um <laughs> spending your birthday evening with us you can go have <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much thank you and so We'll stay in touch. Bye. 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 Everyone. Thank you. That was so cool. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I hope everyone wants to check it out. I, I got some um, insights out of that already, Abigail, that I think maybe we can bring back, right? So yeah. um, intergenerational communication is really important. Um, you have to make it engaging and accessible, whatever it is we do, and being engaging is really important. Um, and art, a creative approach can change paradigm, create a paradigm shift, can change people's imaginations, which I think is a really cool thing. Um, so, okay, let's see. What's next? So, yeah, let's talk about some of the creative initiatives that we found. I mean, I know you had one, you had an epiphany during lockdown, didn't you, about fast fashion and yeah. you know, the creative approach to dealing with that. Okay, so um, in lockdown, uh, my friend was furloughed and she actually works in Primark, which is a fast fashion business. And um, because she lives at home, she never really had to pay the bills. It's always the parents paying the bills. So she was getting loads and loads of money throughout lockdown. And she kept buying loads of clothes online from Pretty Little Thing and Misguided and fast fashion businesses. And it really got me thinking, like, she kept showing me these outfits. And I was like, nice outfit, but where does it come from? Um, and then, like, I looked into it and it was really worrying, like, um, thinking how our Western consumerist culture is exploiting the poorest of society in places we don't even think about. And the, as well, the impact on the environment is just awful. Um, fast fashion and the textile industry is the second biggest polluting industry. Um, so it's definitely, it's terrible for the environment. And I had a week, a week work experience with I Have A Voice, which I'm now an ambassador for. And that gave me the opportunity to start News To Reuse with a group of six farmers across the country. And our main aim is to get fast fashion on the curriculum because it's not something that's really taught about enough. Um, I definitely didn't really know much about it before lockdown and I know a lot of my friends still don't know much too too much about it. Um, so we started an Instagram called News to Reuse and we are sharing tips and tricks on how we can feed into a circular economy that's be that benefits the environment as well as um, creative things we can do ourselves like thrifting and buying second hand and also reworking our own clothes. Like um, I had a dress um, in the cupboard and I'd not worn it for years so I decided to get a sewing kit out and try and change it into something I would wear mm -hmm. and then there were people especially now during coronavirus plastic and plastic face color coverings is a big worry because um, plastic has a lifespan of 450 years so I know a lot of people are making their own masks so I think that's definitely something that people should think about and just use their own things they have already and just kind of be creative with what they've got Mm -hmm. sometimes I have to remind myself um, I think our shopping um, our shopping wiring is so hardwired you know you want to go out there and you want to buy something and that's just an activity that you do whether you need anything or not yeah definitely. I have to tell myself sometimes I have to tell myself I have everything I need you know when I have the urge to just buy the next thing I say to myself 
what if I have everything I need? That's a change in imagination, right? Like, yeah. Um, maybe everything I have is right here. It's, it's worth it. Right here. Yeah, I mean, I think everyone needs to start thinking like that. Like, we have what we need. And I think lockdown has really made people a bit more humble and appreciate what they've already got. But I know social media is a massive influence on younger people, especially teenagers. And it's kind of like you have to have a new outfit every time you post a photo. And I think that's definitely a mindset we need to get out of and we need to be more creative with what we get and just use what we have and be more resourceful. Yeah. I agree. I think lockdown has been a massive eye-opener for loads of people. Not only with, like, fashion, but my mum, she's doing the gardening now and she's, like, obsessed with it. Like, we've got a compost bin and, you know, we're, like, trying to be more sustainable in our household because I think just, like, seeing stories across the world of how lockdown and, you know, coronavirus, it stopped um, pollution and, like, neighbourhoods could see the Himalayas for the first time in their lives. And I think it's just amazing to see how nature has responded to our lack of input as humans maybe also it's just the fact that we have enough you know we always think oh someday i'm going to get more sustainable or someday i'm going to grow a garden and grow my own food but suddenly we had the time to try all the things we didn't have a chance to try before it's like oh well i might as well try sewing because i yeah. don't have to, like run out to work every day anymore so might as well so maybe maybe giving ourselves time for creativity is something that we should add as an insight yeah so i also wanted to um Talk, thank you for that. Um, I just wanted to share, make sure that I shared another amazing project that I think people will love. Um, my friend Colleen Flanagan is an artist who works on the West Coast of the United States. And she has created something called the Living Sea Sculpture. And once again, I can't show you to share my screen. But what she does is she makes these really beautiful, intricate sculptures out of metal. And she runs an electric current through them. and installs them in places where corals need restoring. And the electrified metal has the effect of um, attracting young corals so that the young corals grow up there and create a habitat to restore the entire ecosystem. Um, I'm not sure if Colleen is actually in, oh, she is. Colleen is actually in here with us. Colleen, if you can wave hi in the questions box, that would be great. Hello, <laughs> thank you for joining us. Um, so yeah, so this, this artwork, as she has one now called Zoe, and it's in Cozumel, Mexico. You can you can dive through it. You can. She has volunteers going in and taking care of all the creatures there, cleaning it. And there's even a live webcam that you can go check out. Hi, Colleen. Hi. That's so crazy. I feel like <laughs> what a great morning. Wait, how do I even get to see you guys? Uh, there's a button for the camera in the bottom, along with the mm -hmm. microphone button. Should the bottom left button at the bottom of your window. Oh yeah, like a like a normal everyday zoom and hey, okay. so great to see you. So yeah, I mean, um, we have you on here. So do you want to talk about the Living Sea Sculpture and how you came up with this amazing idea of living art in uh, that like helps to improve an ecological habitat? Well, I thought you did a great job. Thank you guys for having me. Um, so. The Living Sea Sculpture, specifically the process for the reefs that I've been really excited about is where you take a metal structure, as you said, and you add a low volt electrical current that basically is localized boost of pH. So as corals right now are having a harder time getting their calcium carbonate with climate change and acidification, the minerals deposit, and then it becomes this fortified, um, living ecological, you know, collaboration with the, the all the organisms. And right now I'm working like this week with a, a guy here in Santa Cruz to try to start using computational media more and keep bringing in the more discipline. So as you said, we can reach people who are excited about artificial intelligence, or excited about VR, excited about planting gardens. And we start to fuse all these passions and skill sets that then go into like policy and governance and businesses and divers and activism. It just kind of gives you a real cool tool to work with everybody. I don't know if that's a good clarity. Ask me a question. <laughs> no, you, well, you're an artist, right? And this is what, you're, an, really, yeah. what you're doing is really scientific. How did you end up bridging those things? 
So my background in uh, arts and crafts was a big focus in metalsmithing, which has a lot of like patinas, chemistry. I loved electrolysis, which was um, electrifying, say a cauliflower in a bath so that I could end up with a copper cauliflower. So it's taking like a plant and then turning, you know, creating a plated cauliflower. And then I learned that you could use the same type of process to take metal, electrify it, the minerals deposit. So you're plating minerals with calcium, which is the same thing corals use to build their skeleton. So it's just a sort of flip of how can I stop just sourcing nature to make like cool jewelry or something sculptural and actually collaborate and it, it felt just like the super aha and my love of science and investigation and research has been with me all my life but now for 14 years I've been working with the scientists I work with the marine labs and it's it's just natural right to have science and artists work together because we're all kind of one's just using more logic at times intuition and then we just kind of find our um, our other half and our complements within each other. It is actually that when you said that you are co-creating art with nature and it's constantly, the thing about the living sea sculpture is that it's constantly evolving, right? It never sits still. The, um, the more creatures go there, the more creatures go there. And you have that, that webcam. Sometimes I check in on it and I sometimes feel like I'm seeing the same fishes go by. Like I'm starting to recognize characters like, Oh, hi, I know that guy. Yay. <laughs> mm -hmm. My sister really wants to write a book with me. We've been like all the Zoe visitors, you know, we keep coming up with um, how, ways to try to, as you say, use the camera to not just, it's it's catching uh, data. It's catching stuff for that cultural portal. How you had it streaming in your cool sound and eleventh um, hour project, where it can be projected. It can be projection mapped. So that's that live stream. It's down right now because of the hurricane. I guess they had a little bit of a glitch. But usually you can go to a Living Sea Sculpture YouTube channel to sort of check in and see who's visiting. And um, and so, yeah. We um so we're probably going to get kicked out of the breakout room and have to go back soon. But we've been trying to come up with like a list of insights to take back with us. So as an artist who works in conservation, do you have what insight can you share about how and why we should, in general, be applying our imaginations to solving environmental problems? Well, I can't tell others how or why as much as to say like. For me, it's really fun. It's what generates my own life. And if I didn't do it, I think I'd just be completely and utterly depressed because I really love um, wildlife and nature. And I get saddened to think that people will try to kind of come up with quick fixes without remembering that it's like this huge cycle of you love life, you artists are, her artists see um, in their imagination and, and form, and that should be part of the dialogue for all of our children challenging global solutions so i think all anyone who's using their hands and making things they're in the physical world and so they should be a part of creating that future and transition something like that thank That's you guys i'm so excited that i got to see you i just didn't expect that so <laughs> <laughs> no neither was i it's really great to see you thank you so much Thank you. Um, Thank you. Yeah, I guess Abigail and I, are, we're, we're going to like sit here and hammer out some some of the points that we're going to take back. You can stay on with us, Colleen, if you want to. Let's see if there's any questions in the question boxes. I don't think there is. Um, so yeah, I think we don't have a massive audience, actually. Um, so what are the points we're going to take back, Abigail? Um, I think making time for creativity and using what like our passions and then mixing it with environmental issues so you know if your passion is art create art about the about the environment if it's music write songs about the environment it's really about like merging creativity and the environment together and coming up with solutions that you're you know and be inspired by others like pledge to share innovative ideas and be inspired by other artists that's a good one. Are you writing all these down? Because um, because I have this crazy thing of scribbles, and I don't think I'm going to be able to do it. With it. These are creative minds at work, obviously. Can I ask you guys a question? Because sure. the the question like art about like art about nature, music about it. 
I like to be like art as ecology, like it's part of the actual solution. Do you have ideas for how we can create more of that So invitation to, to let the artist just be part of the, these, you know, the global solutions. They're not just cultural outreach, you know, they're also. That's a really, yeah. I mean, that's, that's what you're doing. Hi everyone and welcome to the local community um, action program and I'm going to be taking loads of notes um, of everything that you come up with. I think uh, I'm right in thinking we should have a totally blank question um, panel here so as we propose actions I'm going to type in ones that we hear from the panel um, but we want you to type in uh, actions that you'd like to see proposed at local community level, um, and then we will discuss those and uh, see where we get to. We've got about half an hour, 40 minutes. So, Flora, I was so thrilled with the actions that you proposed. So why don't you start um, yeah. with, uh, with yours? And uh, Ella hasn't heard these yet, so I hope you'll be as enthusiastic as I was. Thank you, Flora. All right. Um, so, first of all, I wanted to talk about farming um, within the community, um, local, um, maybe within Cambridgeshire or just any community. Um, and um, it's actually farming is 1% to 2% of GH greenhouse gas emissions um, globally. Um, so, I think we need to pursue some nature friendly initiatives in farming. Um, this could be in the form of agroforestry, um, which is actually planting trees directly within crop fields. Um, so they're kind of planted in columns and um, it means that farming isn't done in a monoculture um, which increases biodiversity um, and this is something that can be done kind of locally within farmland surrounding um, whichever community we're, we're talking about. Um, I think there's other small steps close to home that we can do which is planting trees in every small community. I think um, this is actually part of the national plan um, we need to just be planting trees to actually offset the carbon emissions that we're producing at the moment. Um, and it's one of the major um, major ones that's being uh, touted at the moment. Um, and then just creating new protected natural sites close by, protecting what we already have. Um, so much of the time, community level action is based around, I don't know, it could be um, jobs, um, new, new jobs or building houses um, and I think what we need to get people together as a community to talk about how land should be used so it's not just councils discussing but for example a community orchard um, to make somewhere that's a protected site for people to enjoy um, and then also green taxes um, so taxing creating like carbon credits um, and um, yeah taxing um, taxing consumers that use um, anything that involves more carbon emissions. Um, and then my last one was actually IKEA, as more as a positive note, IKEA um, has committed to net zero carbon by 2030. Um, they're committed to using renewable and recycled materials such as sustainable cotton. They've actually decreased their footprint by 4.3%. Um, and then there's also Unilever and they've been trailblazers in this area as well. Um, so. <laughs> Um, yeah, that was just a positive note at the end. In terms of business, I think business needs to take the lead um, because obviously business has its downfalls as well in terms of uh, the environment. But local companies too can go zero carbon. That's that's yeah, really, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Okay, um, Ella, what were you going to come up with? Um, so just on, on what Flora said there, um, protecting what we already have really struck with me because it's so true. We're thinking of all these solutions to try and fix everything and replant trees, but we do still have a lot of beautiful areas left, especially in the UK, and a lot of our local communities really care about about those places. So um, I really like the idea of having protected places as well, like you mentioned, an orchard. And if, if there's anything we can do, do that within a community that there could even be a donation to walk through the gardens or whatever to ensure that the upkeep of it. Um, I also had a similar uh, idea for farming and uh, proposing farming workshops and teaching people how to garden. Um, 
grow their own grow their own fruit and veg obviously a lot more sustainable with that um, I know there are a few villages in the UK that do this, but when there's a lot of farms in the area, if, for example, one farm has too many courgettes and one has too many pumpkins, there's a community fridge and essentially everybody swaps fruit and veg depending on what you're growing. So if we can, you know, create somewhere like that and then have a community fridge, which means nothing goes to waste, that would be brilliant. I think what's important as well is I know gardening and farming sort of targets middle class um, people. So we want to make sure that poorer people in society and people that don't necessarily have gardens can also figure out even how to plant things inside and what can they grow inside and um, utilising utilizing any sort of outdoor space we've got. Um, so yeah, that, that was my thought on that. I think it's a really important one. Um, and as well, just letting people know where their food comes from and just creating a much healthier attitude and relationship with our food and pride in growing it. and. Um, yeah, so uh, alongside that ecological planting, planting the right um, flowers for bees and insects that um, attracts them to increase population. Um, this could also then lead into things like beekeeping in the areas and ensuring bee population like that, which is, you know, could be a really nice um, community activity. Um, I think what's really important is trying to get everybody a bit more politically active than they currently are because a lot of people feel really helpless and there is actually a lot we can do within our communities just like I'd mentioned before um, just emailing your MP with issues that are there and just knowing that people can put their voice across and, and, and talk to people and we're, we're not just completely voiceless so encouraging that making sure people are educated in what policies are being talked about and trying to be passed through at the moment. Um, if we want to take it digitally, there's also things like we can get a QR code, which somebody can scan and it immediately pops up with like the email to their MP, like MP or information on this talk that we're going to have in the community hall next week. Um, so I think, yeah, just a real push for that and, and not overwhelming people with the politics, but making people feel like it's totally um, within their capability to address the issues. Okay. Um, so, yes, I'm um, doing this because um, we have a, a Transition Towns group here in Buntingford, where I live, and Transition Towns are preparing uh, communities for the post-carbon era, the era in which we will live without any fossil fuels. And uh, we're starting with small campaigns. We have a campaign called Plastic Free Buntingford. But if you're not living in a transition town, I urge you to create one because though I would entirely support and endorse what um, Ella and, and Flora have said, um, those issues are what come up when you're looking at a transition farm, uh, a transition town. And we have now a community garden here in Buntingford, which uh, produces wonderful produce. Um, uh, my wife has just rejoiced in the rhubarb that it produces. And that's something that we as a community feel really good about. And uh, in this effort to transition people from um, meat eating, car driving, motorcycle riding, uh, fossil fuel, overseas holiday um, going on type of lifestyle, which, uh, yes, is not good for the planet, um, we can educate them through this transition town thing. But also, um, as the founder of Transition Towns, Rob Hopkins, has just written a book called From What Is to What If, and it's about encouraging the imagination, which I know Karen is talking about in her group. Individuals' imagination and artistic creativity. Um, Ella and I talked earlier about Augusto Bull and the theater of the oppressed. Uh, that kind of creativity is a much more powerful shift way to shift people's minds and values that we were talking about earlier um, towards the um, behaviors and values that actually support a sustainable society and um, Rob talks about um, play streets where you actually close your street for a day or a week so that children can play during half term in the streets and cars are just kept away and he talks about how in Tooting which is a fairly depressing part of South London uh, a group created a village green and a bus turning circle. 
and they set up food stalls and uh, bike repair things and conjurers and bands and created a, tr a wonderful community center uh, just by laying a little bit of uh, turf on the, on the bus turning circle and making it into what uh, everyone enjoyed as a village green. Now that's the kind of imagination that can transform local communities. And that's what we should be thinking about. So um, yes, uh, Mary has written uh, um, uh, a suggestion for action. Local schools uh, should be written to and uh, assemblies should be done on climate change. We do this on peace. Well, we did it on plastic free Buntingford too. Uh, also, someone has said we need to engage with local government. Now, I urge all of you who are watching this, and there's about a dozen of you, get into that um, question thing and start upvoting the, um, the, the, the actions that you um, want to encourage. It was the schools, sorry. It was uh, engaging with, with schools and um, making sure we're doing assemblies about schools, I think is so crucial. I think that's an absolutely fantastic idea. And I was even writing an email to my school the other day suggesting me to come in and just speak to all of the kids about um, about what's going on because I really think so many children just don't actually know what, what they're walking into and as well teachers. And I think if we implant it in the minds that young, then it, it's it, that's the best way to go from, um, from here. I think um, as well, or, but like I say, political theatre, art forms, things like that, that we can take into schools so that kids don't get bored with just the preaching um, of, of what's happening to the world they're about to grow up into, um, but allowing them to be actively engaged and to also, also, also develop these values and ideas for themselves through play. And like David was saying, the, the idea of play suites and art and things like that, I think is so, so important. Um, so this is um, this is one of the things we were saying is it's such an issue. It's you know it, it, it's causing so many problems. Our situation right now, the fact that transport is so expensive and housing is so expensive and scarce, and that's really affecting the way we can live our lives and how we can sort of move forward from this. So you know if if we are able to get you know cheaper cheaper public transport, it'll encourage more people to use public transport and sharing the carbon emissions rather than driving around in your car. Um, and as well, businesses, again, like we say, I think it's going to take a real drive for businesses in the area to commit to becoming carbon neutral. But I think if we go through councils and governments and speak with them to try and set an incentive this is a thing, it's business and businesses want to make money so we need to set some sort of incentive that is going to benefit them because otherwise that it, it's too much of a jump for some businesses to just say, yeah, absolutely, we'll commit to it. And it's the same with the government with, you know, transport and housing and it, it is going to, it's going to take a push. Okay, thanks, thanks. Um, I'd like to, uh, I see a question from my old friend Liam Doherty who's, uh, um, they, they're taking it global in Toronto, Canada. And he says, I'd love to see action projects as a core part of the schooling experience, um, actual real world engagements that have a measurable impact on our world and our communities. Um, Liam, of course you're right. And it was in Toronto, Canada that we had the big eco-ed conference back in 1992, about uh, three months after um, um, the Rio Earth Summit, uh, which was all about eco-education, and we've really been pushing it, and governments just haven't done it. We got some way down the road to, uh, you know, inst not institutionalizing, um, infrastructuralizing uh, environmental education in schools um, during the period of the Labour government at the beginning of the century, and then it was rather ruthlessly dismantled by um, the Conservative government when Michael Gove was the uh, Minister of Education here in the UK, but almost everywhere, apart from odd countries like, oh, not odd countries, wonderful countries like Denmark and, and uh, Singapore and South Korea, where environmental education is absolutely front and centre in the curricula, it's not there at the moment and um, in our country and in many others. 
And as we said in that sketch, if we're not even educating the young people about the problems that they're, they're coming out of school to face, then we're really doing them a huge disservice. And uh, I think that you're right that we can lobby local schools to um, take action. And uh, if the teachers don't do it, I think we should encourage students themselves to take action because schools are sort of a democracy and the, the best schools have very active student councils. And uh, young people who are on our panel tonight know that schools have not taught them what they know today about environmental issues. Um, they had to learn it in spite of schools, not in schools. And so therefore, I think it's absolutely imperative uh, to do that eco-education. And as Liam says, uh, action projects, taking action, growing schools, having farms and schools, all that kind of thing, is far and away the best way to teach people about environmental issues. Uh, if you try and teach them in a classroom, they retain 10%. If they read a book, they retain about 50%, 15%. If they actually go out and do something, they retain 50 to 60%. And if they, they, they are encouraged to do peer education and teach other students about it, um, they retain 90% of the message. So it is the most effective form of education. And I would really encourage that. We have another uh, question um, from Tamara uh, at IAEA, hands-on engagement of young people in environmental protection and the key aspects of the environment. For example, surveys of wildlife, environmental monitoring, um, linking these to everyday choices. They can then educate their families about that. What do you think about that and the other questions that have come up, uh, Flora? Um, so I think in terms of educating young people, um, one of the things of uh, carbon taxing, oh, I think I know. Um, uh, one of the things with carbon taxing is actually it generates a revenue to the government which they can invest in um, services such as education. Um, I listened to a talk recently of someone called Edward Lee, I think he's local to Cambridge, um, and he was talking about instead of having, there's something that's been kind of proposed as universal basic income. Um, instead of this, it would be universal um, like tertiary services, I think that's what it was called. So actually investing in educating people right up to possibly university level um, through carbon taxing. Um, so this is quite a radical idea, um, but interesting. Um, so, um, yeah, I thought about that. Um, and uh, there was, what was the other, what was the most recent question? Uh, I'm just looking here. Hands-on engagement of young people in environmental protection. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And the bottom, Tamara's question um, from IAEA, which stands for, uh, I can't quite remember what. International Atomic Energy Authority. <laughs> Thank you, Trish. <laughs> okay. Um. What do you think about uh, the, you, you know, I mean, it's, it's monitoring hedgehogs, all kinds of things that, um, um, you know, we, we did with, uh, oh, I can't remember, there was a, a wonderful um, group that um, used to uh, actually do um, surveys of British birds and supporting, uh, getting young people to do um, practical surveys of uh, weather patterns and, and uh, bird populations and so on, all that kind of thing which actually contributed. Al Gore did a, a, a massive program to engage young people in actually monitoring the environment as they grow up. And what do you think of that idea? Does that make sense to you? Um, there's something, there's an open data platform called Restore I heard about, which I think is like where people feed into it and it's like anyone can feed into it. And it's just, yeah, um, kind of, um, yeah, an open data platform where people just record what they've seen locally to them. And it's more of a kind of feedback through different people locally and in the community um, to just get more interested in nature and wildlife. Great. Ella, what do you think? Have you been watching the questions? Yeah, absolutely. Just on that, I think absolutely, I think definitely the hands-on is actually about getting people involved and it just comes back to making people feel accountable and having like the, feeling like they're involved. Um, I wonder if, again, that you know, that's something that we can push for schools to be doing as well in their geography classes and things like that need to be uh, more focused towards that and monitoring what's going on now and more the future. 
um, of geography and, and where it's heading. Um, and then, yeah, as well, if, if we can encourage community projects where the community is leading in this survey, in this survey, if it can be as simple as something online and on this platform, then brilliant. Um, and yeah, like like you say, giving people a responsibility to feel like they're doing something themselves. If we encourage that hands-onness as well from young people, it means we'll have more people to go into, go, like you say, go into their schools and talk to their peers about their findings and what's going on. And it becomes a bit more relatable when it's young people to young people in schools as well. So I really think that's a fantastic idea, and I, I, I hadn't quite thought of it. So. Okay, very good. Um, yeah, obviously, um, I, I, I would entirely agree. And I would actually say that uh, getting young people to do arts and drama about um, uh, these issues and exploring them through theatre, which is what we've done for 40 years in Peace Jar, using um, theatre techniques like, like forum theatre, which you probably know about, Ella. Yeah. Um, that, that's, that's um, you know, a great way of exploring... Um, these issues. But I think, you know, um, Flora and bo well, both of you have been talking about lobbying and writing to your MPs. I think this absence of um, environmental education in the formal exam and curricula is something that you really can take on uh, at a local level and, and get schools to take seriously. Now, um, my niece married a teacher and he told me the other day that he just read an article about the 200 things that uh, someone had su suggested that he ought to be teaching that weren't in the national curricula. And he said, as a teacher, you know, we, we look at these things. You've got to teach about peace. You've got to teach about food. You've got to teach about sexuality. You've got to teach about, you know, all these things that uh, people feel, population growth. You know, this is all stuff that you've got to teach about. And if they taught about everything that everybody feels they should teach about, uh, there wouldn't be any space left in the curriculum. However, I told him that the one thing that you do need to teach about is the fact that this world that we're living in at the moment will likely disappear or become hugely polluted and uncomfortable to live in unless you teach them about this issue. And he didn't have an answer to that. So I think that that's probably something that we really used to need to pull out. Now, um, the um, uh, Taking It Global, which my friend Liam runs, um, has got a program um, funded by the government of Canada and supported by 3,953 projects with four and a bit million uh, Canadian dollars. That's a whole lot more than any local program that I've ever heard about. Maybe in a rich place like uh, Cambridge, you have programs like that, but do you know of any, um, Flora? Um, I don't, no, I would like to hear about some. Um, I know there's the Wildlife Trust that runs... Um, so Wildlife Trust, that's the one I was thinking of, yeah. Runs, like, there's something really nearby to where I live and they do like events every now and again, but I think they, they could probably be more. Yeah, I don't think the Wildlife Trust is nearly as well-funded as that, um, but yeah. they were the ones that did all that monitoring, yeah, and um, the, the, the young sort of bee, uh, there was a whole thing going on on bees um, that they did, which was terrific. But those kinds of things, I think, are, are, are really um, wonderful. Um, so, yes, there's uh, Rising Youth uh, for more information. There you go. Um, now, we have just heard that there is a prize offered by Prince William and David Attenborough for a massive amount of money over the next 10 years for projects that are going to help save the planet. So do we have any entries, please, because plagiarism is the most sincere form of flattery, and if anyone has any good ideas, we shall uh, gobble them up in peace, child, and put them forward to, to uh, Prince William and David Attenborough. Um, but no, it's a serious, serious initiative, and I think it's done in partnership with WWF and others um, to have these prizes. And I think it's a very useful question, actually, to raise to this whole uh, debate that we actually have quite a lot of money coming in for 50 million pounds, that's a lot of money, for um, action projects were which will really put a dent in the uh, rising carbon emissions. So any ideas, Ella? Oh, wow. Too many ideas. <laughs> <laughs> Go for it. Oh, goodness. Um, so, well, I actually just quick, quickly wanted to just address 
a question which was about the the, plastic, uh, the, the reduction of packaging actually only because I saw um, I saw a town did this they all went shopping on a Saturday Sunday to their local supermarket scanned everything through and stood at the end and emptied took all the plastic from their food and anything that they needed to put they brought glass containers and at the end of the of the weekend there was just so much plastic left in the supermarkets which um they'd encourage them to uh, push for less plastic packaging um and it's quite powerful so i think that's a really fun uh, fun thing to do community wise that could sort of tackle that packaging um yeah, we've done that it's called a great unwrapping great unwrapping that's what it's called <laughs> such a good idea i love that in terms of um yes initiatives that we can um give give prizes for can you know can we encourage things like um thinking of or, or doing more research into for example nuclear energy and green power and i think all these conversations that we're still having and even um, some of the most intelligent people in this debate are still talking about and discovering it might be better to into that territory and get as many minds as possible from across the country to uh, do their research and find their things and interview people and do their digging. So I think something like that would be a, would be a good idea. Um, otherwise, if we want to focus more on sustainability and lifestyle and values, then we can um, maybe encourage something that enables people to... Um, talk a little bit more or hold workshops about food and planting and eating less meat um, and things like that and then maybe see the progress of the community and what percentage of people have changed their diet slightly or what percentage of people are buying less um, buying less vegetables but in plastic wrapping, uh, in plastic wrapping things like that and, and maybe a new project for the kids or even just for their for their parents and their immediate family how much can they influence the way they change their, their habits and their lifestyle that will benefit the environment? And it could be a project about different ways the kids have tried to. Okay, that Ella. Does that make sense? It does, it does. I, I mean, I, I, um, I do think that the lifestyle and values that uh, you're talking about uh, is something that can be generated locally. And uh, the, the opportunity to generate things like that locally is what Transition Towns is all about. But I'd like to recast that idea uh, into a sort of umbrella project, which is why don't we push for local Green New Deals, you know? Because there's a fellow here who's asked, uh, I can't remember who, who it is, put pressure on companies to commit to decreasing their carbon footprint and their use of pl plastic through buying shares and speaking to shareholders. Um, uh, and threatening to do boycotts, etc. We can do that locally. You know, yeah. I, I think that that's something that we could actually create a Green New Deal for Buntingford and, um, you know, generate our own um, strategies for, for recasting the values of our community in uh, a sustainable way. Yeah. Now, Cambridge is the fastest, um, <coughs> one of the fastest growing economic areas in Europe. <coughs> And I think that you can look at um, the Science Park in Cambridge and even a place like Middlesbrough, Ella, which is where you're from. You know, those community-based actions have a Green New Deal for the Northeast. Yeah. Brexit goes through without a deal. You might lose this out. You know, you need a re Green New Deal for uh, revitalizing that area. Yeah. To be honest, I've never really thought about the area for area of Green New Deal, but absolutely, as communities, we can <coughs> do the research and contact businesses and, and push for a real Green New Deal, community by community. <coughs> I've been reading um, I've been reading a chapter of On Fire by Naomi Klein, and there's um, there's a little chapter on stop trying to save the world all by yourself and this culture of um, it was all almost trying to pin I, I know we're talking about lifestyle change and, and it is things like that but also it's really important not to beat yourself up for you know one thing that that gives you pleasure once a year and if you know if you're eat, you don't eat meat you're vegan you do this that you fight for the environment you lobby to MPs and things like that it's really important to check in sometimes because we've almost a lot of it's because of our leaders where we are now and 
there's a real tendency for them to get us fighting against each other and to be putting uh, uh, putting this on people and feeling almost a little bit guilty for it. So I think that's just one thing I wanted to mention. And um, you know, we can we can do more as um, as a group and as a community. We can really really push. So I think. Um, yeah, the the holiday once a year would be great if you can get to Cornwall and Devon when it's sunny, beautiful. Um, but this isn't about t taking away everybody's freedoms. We have to absolutely live like this. It's about collective effort to change this and change this, encourage more people to live like this. And you know, it's, it's going to take a lot of moving parts. So that's that. I would say. Yeah, I was just thinking about um, carbon uh vouchers it could be possible that we have like a carbon voucher system i think this could possibly be quite, quite unpopular with some people who want to fly more but i mean it could work and it could be something that could be implemented um so yeah carbon vouchers um is something that could be explored more yeah carbon rationing um yeah. we raised that before um so that everyone would have their own personal carbon budget um and if they chose to spend that on one foreign holiday a year rather than um yeah. would be to businesses more as well so i don't know whether there's businesses that use like vast amounts of air miles or not but possibly um, but yeah sorry carry on, yeah. no I, I think that that's that's a really really serious one um we're, we're, as I say, we're coming to an end. So um, what I would like to, to um, do is to um, go back over the local actions that we, we thought about. Um, I think when we come back into the plenary, uh, we have a very short time to report back from this group. Um, can I ask you each, uh, Ella and Flora, to choose two of the things that we've raised um, and just uh, propose them, and then I will choose two as well. This idea of uh, local transportation has come up in a couple of questions, which I think, um, you know, is, is clearly something that can be managed locally. Uh, introducing more bike lanes, uh, more footpaths, uh, encouraging people to, to build green spaces, community spaces, community gardens. Uh, that would be all part of my Green New Deal uh, idea. So <laughs> that would be local Green New Deal would be all part of the planning there. And I think that that's the, the kind of imagination that um, uh, Rob Hopkins is looking for in his uh, what is to what if. And, and it's all generated by the imagination that we've been seeing here. Um, I wonder which of you, um, Flora, Ella, would like to focus on the, the values and the lifestyle issue, because that's obviously something that came up in the earlier discussion as something that our generation has got wrong uh, and which your generation, I hope, will get right. Um, and this whole um, intergenerational dialogue was kicked off, as you know, by Lauren. And she said, we are the, the tolerance generation. Um, we, d we don't, th those filters are not on our eyes anymore as they were uh, when I was growing up. So I think that that's something that um, you, uh, one of you should talk to because I think that you are emerging with uh, different values towards people of different color, LGBTQ, all this, um, these different things which are absolutely natural to you as well as the idea of being a digital native because that is a different um, thing. So got a few more minutes. Any other questions that have come up from anyone? Yeah, I really love the idea of black marking of green piping um, companies. So this is from Roger who said, how about a green pipe mark or a black mark on, on companies? And I assume you mean whether they are carbon neutral or sustainable and there's just a really simple um, icon that has to be public, that has to be printed on whatever product or whatever business. So um, I wonder if that, that could work. And then that's an immediate visual thing for someone to pick up a product and, the product and be like, oh no, it's black mark. I'll definitely go for this one. <laughs> it might work, but I like the idea of it. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I was really going to talk about low energy housing too, because uh, I live in a low energy house and uh, it's um, it's so blissful having lived in a, a very big old drafty house to move into a house where you actually feel war warm when you walk in the front door. And, um, and it's, it's just nice to know that you're not burning up um, 
the planet by by keeping yourself warm in the winter and uh, passive houses you could almost keep warm on on body heat so that is an, an an incredibly good idea and i think i'm right in saying that um housing standards in sweden uh, and other parts of scandinavia are much much higher than they are here and all new houses have to be built with um uh ground source heat pumps and so on and those kind of housing regulations would uh, massively decrease the carbon footprint of uh housing and again that's something that uh, local authorities can introduce as a, a, a local um initiative and i do know that the city of malmo in sweden was looking to go totally carbon neutral by 2025 which is about 10 or 15 years before the rest of the country and that's the kind of local um initiative that that we should follow in in our communities um so that would be in contract with buyers of the land and the developers it would have to be enforced before anything was agreed essentially uh, absolutely it's a planning regulation that's very easy to impose uh and we know that we've got to build a lot more homes in in the UK so that that's an issue hello hello everyone welcome to the national policy actions breakout panel um we're going to talk a bit more about um ideas that come up about how countries can tackle climate change at the national level um let's think of how to how to introduce things so oddly um i am and have been since 2009 the climate change advisor to president president nasheed of the maldives um who was president there between 2009 and 2012 when there was a coup long story um they're now back uh, in government and democracy has been restored but it's kind of an interesting case study for me because we de developed this plan to be carbon to be the world's first carbon neutral country um and you know the the government of the maldives agreed to that the president was went around the world saying we're going to be the world's first carbon neutral country and then it came down to actually doing it right now the way the maldives uh generates its electricity at the moment you may not be able to believe this but it comes from diesel generators because it's lots and lots of tiny islands there's about 150 islands and each one has these big diesel generators which are generating electricity so there's some guy there who's putting diesel in the engine just like basically leaving your car on and and leaving the lights on that's how it works at an island scale basically so the whole of the maldives is run on fossil fuel then you've got all of the boats that go between the islands all of those are using fossil fuels as well and you've got all of the international flights that come and go because it's a tourist economy all of that's using kerosene jet fuel and so on yeah then you've got plastic and all sorts of things which are additional challenges um so it's a lot easier said than done having a carbon neutral target um you can you know the most obvious way to substitute for the diesel generators was to use solar power <clears throat> but you need quite a lot of solar panels to to generate you know 10 or 20 or 30 megawatts um which is the kind of power you need to run a big island with a big town on it um like the capital city male and you know there isn't much land there because what land is there has got some jungle on it or it's beaches or it's got people's houses or whatever so for me this really raised a lot of the trade offs one of the reasons I'm pro nuclear actually is because of the land use challenges that if you you need to use country sized developments of renewables if you're serious actually about using wind and solar to 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 fully decarbonize an economy um, and that's only the electricity side when you start doing transport and you need hydrogen and blah, 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 then you you really have huge huge amounts of 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 energy that you need to get um <clears throat> so you know for me the ten, it's a technical challenge how you make how you make this real right yes we can sit and waffle on about education and values and bloody blah, blah but ultimately you have to switch the diesel generator off and you have to replace it with something zero carbon what's that going to be you're not going to convince people to 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 live in the dark you know we're all using electricity here most of us have probably been on on flights before and plan to do so again those need to be zero carbon you can't just abandon the entire uh, infrastructure of modern existence so that that's my philosophy anyway um so so it is primarily a technical challenge as i see it and, and what are the what's the kind of optimal optimal technology mix that you can that you can have in a country to to achieve to realistically achieve a zero carbon target and when i say realistically i mean something which is politically achievable 
So Extinction Rebellion can go out there and say, yes, we should do this by 2025. Um, that means that the majority of the country will lose their jobs. Right? That means people will be in the streets rebelling against it. I'm old enough to remember back in 2000 when the truck drivers came out on strike because of the increase in um, diesel. So just a, a small environmental tax that applied to, applied to that. And they, they were blockading the refineries. They were, you know, the whole country was going to shut down. Um, a similar thing happened in France when you had the so-called gilets jaunes, the people with the yellow vests who came out protesting against climate change policies because it was affecting their jobs and their livelihoods as working people. So whatever you propose has to be politically realistic. Um, it, and, and what seems politically realistic to you as an activist in the street isn't the same as what's politically realistic when it comes to, to winning votes and winning elections in a, in a democratic country. So that's kind of setting the scene. For me, all of these questions are, are really key, that the sustainability question is, is political as, as much as it's technical, as much as it's sort of, sort of philosophical or environmental even. Um, Estelle, Rosa, do you have any thoughts to help kick us off really? Yeah, well, I always thought we should uh, address the issue of rewilding as well, because you've been working a lot on that at the moment. And uh, <clears throat> we it's definitely a big issue because uh, it's all for keeping ourselves alive, but we also need to keep the animals alive and everything that keeps us alive. So we can talk about electricity all day, <clears throat> but in the end, um, it's not just about what's going to be zero carbon, it's about um, stopping a habitat loss as well because these are also support the ecological side of our existence. Definitely. Um, someone's written a nice comment there. Wanted to say it's a really nice to see a father-daughter participation. Well done, Rosa. I'm very proud of my daughter. Um, she's doing amazing things and she's incredibly smart. So um, I feel very lucky. I'm proud of my dad. He's good. Yeah. <laughs> Um, moving, Estelle? moving on, Estelle. Hello. Um, I really, really loved your point that you just made, Rosa, actually. I do think it's really, really important that we talk about and think about that sustainability aspect. Um, on the point that you were talking about, Mark, about um, nuclear power and renewables and that kind of thing, I definitely do think it's really, really important that... Um, we do think about the aspects and like of political, like how it's going to affect um, people politically, and also like just how people are able to use that kind of energy in their daily lives in terms of renewables and um, nuclear power. Uh, one hesitation I do have about nuclear power is the whole um, issue surrounding its waste and how we make sure that um, it's done in a sustainable way, I guess, in, in a way that the waste is managed so that it isn't passed off to any more vulnerable countries. Um, for instance, if there was a situation where um, maybe poorer countries were paid to store nuclear waste and that kind of thing, how can we make sure that um, no countries are kind of manipulated into um, doing something which may in the end be harmful or affect um, kind of their country long term and future generations. Um, thanks, there's a, there was a couple question of, there. I like that. One there's got your name on it. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I agree with the earlier point about pushing hard our government, says Tom. Um, we need to, how do we make people care about animals? It seems to rely on empathy so much at the moment. Well, how do you make anyone care about anything? You use empathy, you use human emotions, but you also use the facts and um, what um, what scientists say and what um, everyone, what people should know about um, if it, is it going to support us um, to have more, um, more of an ecological diversity of things. Well, it depends whether you mean wild animals or domestic animals. Wild. Um, I mean, wild animals, then, um, you know, caring about wildlife. Everyone cares about wildlife, actually. That's why David Attenborough is so popular. Yeah. Um, it's not, I don't think it's difficult, actually, to get people to care about, about wild species. Yeah, you just need to um, show them pictures of animals in need, and they go, oh. Yeah. And <laughs> in fact, in fact it's, a, it's, it's odd. People care more about animals than they do about people um, to, a, to quite a significant extent. I mean, to tell you, 
a rather side story. Uh, I'm, I, I'm, I work with the mountain rescue team here in, in the Welsh borders, and we rescued a dog from a cave, and it was all, over, well, not me personally, but the team, and it was all over the press, and it was like, dog rescued from cage, everyone's jumping around, waving hands and clapping. Um, when you rescue, you know, a human from the hilltop with a broken leg, you know, no one, no one gives a toss, really. <laughs> so it's a, I, I think, actually, it's amazing, actually, the whole world isn't vegan, given how much, or maybe it's the whole of Britain isn't vegan, given how much people seem to care about animals. They care um, especially about baby animals as well, yes, so if they puppies. see a if they see a baby cow, they, a calf, they think, oh, I don't want to eat that. When they see an adult cow, they don't care. We need people to make connections between wildlife and our way of life. Uh, comments, comments, Julie. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a question really, like with, with biodiversity, whether we need to make it sort of economically valuable. Should we conserve species because otherwise we, we become poorer in some way or our, our, our society can't function or whether nature has an inherent intrinsic value you know and we should care about the living world because it's the living world um i'm kind of in in that latter camp really um you know i know that being in favor you know if i go to somewhere which is wild and which has got truly wild species on it then that gives me something extra which you don't get from being surrounded by human infrastructure Imagine if humans were the only species left on earth yeah it'd be pretty bad um <laughs> chris Bell says what about the time scale problems with building nuclear power and the capture of r d which could be used for developing technical solutions to renewable energies um good point hopefully it's not either or i mean you know we can develop solar without having to reduce the amount of money we spend on wind hopefully and vice versa and i think it goes for all low carbon technologies um the waste uh, you know i think we can now recycle waste properly um jonathan made the point earlier about the first legacy generation of waste you know, that was from totally different nuclear power stations, mostly which actually were designed to generate plutonium for weapons. So this is, it's not really an argument about what we do in the future, any more than saying we shouldn't go on a modern jet because a biplane crashed in 1956. I mean, it's just, you know, th that's a, it's a talking point. It's not, it's not real. We need to look forward and we need to use better technologies um, which don't leave us with a legacy of waste. Everything, by the way, has waste. Solar panels have waste. They're not particularly recyclable either. So we've got to try to bring a kind of circular economy philosophy into pretty much all of the things that we we use and consume <clears throat> um, um yes did someone mention about intrinsic value yeah it says it does have intrinsic value for example if airlines had a disclaimer explaining how the flight would impact our biodiversity this would help people make these connections um yeah fair point um yeah so i think we agree on the intrinsic uh, intrinsic value issue and it's important i guess with um, adopting zero carbon targets that we don't on targets that we don't just focus exclusively on climate change and that we look at the the issues there. I mean, to give you an example, there's a wind farm. We all in favour of wind. I'm in favour of wind power. There's a wind farm up on I think it's um, Shetland, which is currently being developed in a peat bog. So they're cutting through the peat. It's destroying this fragile landscape. It re releases a lot of carbon. Uh, it's it's very bad, obviously, for the wildlife in that area. So everything has trade offs. And even what we think of as green power, it doesn't not affect wildlife. Um, so, you know, we have to try and do things in the most, uh, in, you know, sensitive way possible. And in fact, that's an argument in favor of nuclear. You can run a whole city with a single nuclear power station on a square kilometer of land. You need 100 times, four, I think it's 400 times more land if you're going to do it with solar. And that's land that you can't rewild, you can't have trees and, you know, natural species living on it. So we've got to focus on the trade-offs and be realistic and not just fool ourselves with you know, uh, wishful thinking. Um, but I do actually have one comment about um, something that's been said in terms of um, the value of that people place on kind of animals and the connection people make between animals and the environment and themselves. I do feel that um, there are a lot of people who do place a lot of value on the environment and they do see the connection between their own life and um, the lives of animals in, you know, that are produced for, farmed for um, meat and that kind of thing. But I also do think that for a lot of people, there's a massive disconnect um, between themselves and um, farm animals and agriculture in general. I think that this is something that really, really needs to be addressed, actually. Um, and I know that ed education has already been talked about quite a lot in uh, the part of the workshop previous to this, 
But I think that through education, not only for school students, but also for the general public, um, we can really start to make sure that these values are some things that a lot more people have access to if not if their parents or family don't necessarily have that as something that they bring their children up with. Um, because I think that in terms of meat production, as I think, I think that you, Mark, may have brought this up slightly in the workshop previous to this, um, in terms of meat production and that kind of thing, I think there is a, a massive harmful effect on the environment, which is quite often ignored by a lot of people because of um, maybe lack of education about the more sustainable ways it can be gone about or um, just lack of education on the actual mm -hmm. negative effects it's happening, having kind of thing. Yeah, would you eat some, would you eat fake meat, laboratory meat? Um, well, I'm a veg. I was raised a vegetarian, so um, I don't think I'd ever eat. Um, mm. That's all right then. If you're already vegetarian, then I can. You know, <laughs> well, the thing is that we need we need the carnivores to have something, have some kind of product that they can, <laughs> that tastes meaty, yeah. is, is sufficiently satisfying, but doesn't have all of the environmental and animal welfare downsides of actual meat. So I'm, I don't know whether lab meat is is ever going to be a sufficiently scalable thing. Or even protein production that's done industrially, like corn and things like that. But you know, they're they're like an order of magnitude better for the environment than actual uh, livestock production. Like so, you know, re rewilding needs huge areas of land, and that means getting the sheep off. Um, and you know, life so, and, and livestock are a big, big, um, big problem. Um, so we've got another another two questions. Couple of okay, how can we steer the um, hold on a sec. How can we steer the government towards a more electric future and make gas obsolete? I e to subside and subsidize probably and encourage people to switch to heat pump and from gas boilers. Um, yeah, actually, we we're in a rented house here and we're in, right in the countryside and we're not on either the gas. We're not on the gas grid. So in fact, this house is um, run using oil, which is even more carbon intensive. Um, it's not it's not our house so i can't do anything about that but um you know we need you know none of uh, pretty much all of the properties around here and in fact most of wales are run on oil um and it's it's a huge huge source of emissions um but it costs thousands of pounds to get a heat pump installed so like for people who don't have much money which is the majority now how are you going to get this through it has to be it has to be incentivized by government, I think. Um, and the policy here has been just really woeful. I mean, even they, they, they should basically make it illegal to put in new gas boilers. They should always be replaced now with heat pumps to to to, to have an elect electrification program. Um, exactly as uh, who is it? Dorothy says, yeah, um, completely, completely agree with that. We've got to switch away from fossil fuels, gas or oil on, into electric power. And that goes for heating as much as it goes for transport. We do actually have an electric car, at least, um, which I don't let Rosa grab the wheel of. In, in the <laughs> rest, um, first, first video, I'm not sure, sure about that metaphor. Um, Chris comes back there and says, Chris Philpott, this is, um, do you think that the green recovery should involve a massive investment in education and training and technical skills, which you'll need for renewable energy development? This would mop up youth unemployment. So apprenticeship schemes, um, things like that. Uh, certainly, green green jobs is a big, big talking point. Um, any thoughts on that, Rosa or Estelle? Estelle, carry on. Okay. Um, no, I was just saying that I do think that education on renewable and in encouraging youth to get more involved in that kind of education, as well as more involved in um, efforts to improve the environment, are really, really important. Luckily, we do have. Um, lots and lots of youth who are just generally interested and passionate about it but um encouraging youth to get more involved in the renewable aspect and learning how they can be part of the um change i think is really important but i think it's also important so that there's an understanding from a lot more people about the actual change and the actual action points that need to be taken forward so that the change that needs to happen can actually take place. Um, 
because with if most of the population simply are passionate about it rather than actually having the facts there's still the issue of people not knowing what issues they need to push with their local government or um, government in general and that kind of thing so I do think it's really important. Um, Tom contributes another Thanks. thought about the yeah about the um the nuclear issue, the poll shows that only a quarter of the audience today believe we need nuclear energy. So, Mark Rose, if you believe in nuclear energy, how do you convince your fellow Greens? Well, that's been the story of my life for the last 10 years, really, and I found that you can't. Um, people believe what they want to believe, damn the science. And I found it particularly ironic that the people who claim to be most concerned about climate change are the same people who continue to oppose one of the most promising zero sources of zero carbon power. I mean, go figure. And they come up with all sorts of um, all sorts of arguments to justify that belief about waste or about Chernobyl or about Fukushima, accidents, radiation. You can tick off the list. But actually, when you look at all of those issues, as I said, in response to what Jonathan said, they are trivial. They're either solvable or they're not even real in any scientifically definable sense. People think that, you know, a million people died at Chernobyl. How many people died at Chernobyl? Ten. No, actually, it's about 50. How many people died at Fukushima from the radiation? Well, 18,500 people died in the tsunami, right? So that's where the people died. Nobody died from radiation. So, But the thing is, it, it, these from radiation. So, But the thing is, it, it, these are anti-science myths which proliferate in the environmental movement, just as anti-science myths proliferate in other political movements because they happen to support beliefs that people already hold. Um, we're all human and we're not, you know, it's it's very difficult, I think, to change people's minds about things that they that they believe in so strongly. There's no way I could, however many pints of beer we consume, that I could change Jonathan's mind about nuclear. And he, to be he, to be fair, couldn't change my mind either. So we either have to agree to disagree, which means, which is a problem because we either build them or we don't. I mean, if we shut down, like if you look at what's happening in Germany, they're shutting down their nuclear power stations and they're, that means they're dependent on coal now until 2038. They've just agreed to keep coal open until for another, well, how many, another nearly 20 years, which is, is that good for the climate? Uh, hands out, maybe we should do a poll on that, whether Germany should, should <laughs> coal fired power stations rather than its nuclear power stations. And who is it that was campaigning to close down all of the nukes and keep the coal open? By default, it's the Greens, the Green Party. So, I find I find this whole thing at a at a logical level completely bizarre, but it is what it is, and you know uh, I have to not get so obsessive about it that I forget all of the good things that environmentalists have, have managed to achieve and continue to continue to achieve. Um, I don't vote green. I, I can't bring myself to vote for the Green Party because of their anti-science stance on this and other issues. But uh, I support Extinction Rebellion and I work with a lot of climate activists on on these kinds of things as well. So it's just tough. Um, but thanks, Tom, for, for, for posing that question because it's, it's certainly not an easy one. Well, um, I, I myself, I talk to a lot of my classmates about it and they are inherently against nuclear power until I tell them um, all, my, um, all the facts that I know and then they, then they think, oh, well, okay, but they, don't, they go home and they talk to their parents and their parents say, no, she's wrong. So it's, um, I think it's a lot about getting in there young and teaching and um, people are giving all the facts when you're at school. So they're uh, leaving the kids to make their own decision, but telling them absolutely all the facts and not, and making sure that you've got the right facts. Of course, people will disagree on what the right facts are, but if you, if you kind of, um, kind of get a kind of... Well, I mean, if you believe in science, yeah. there actually is such a thing as kind of absolute, ob well, objective truth. And you can, you can find that out by assessing the evidence and using the scientific method. So we don't all we don't all have an equal right to claim the facts, let's say, um, and I think you can do that for radiation or nuclear as you can do it for anything else, even including the existence of climate change, which is also questioned by many people who claim to have the science on their side. Um, somebody, uh, I think, is that Julie again? Yeah. Uh, New Zealand can can exist without nuclear energy uh, because there's only well small numbers of people. That's true. Um, other countries have got geothermal power, like Iceland doesn't need nuclear because they've got they can they live on top of a massive volcano and they can use the heat from that to generate power which is which is what they do um she mentions france as well i mean france is uh, uh, about 90 percent nuclear so they've had a zero carbon electricity grid by and large since the 1970s 
you know, should we shut that down? I mean, is that going to help the climate? Should we swap it out for wind and solar? I mean, that doesn't get you anywhere. You're just swapping one zero carbon power for another zero carbon power. So let's get out there and do what we need to do, which is to get fossil fuels off the grid um, and, and out of the economy in general. So to come back to the initial question was how we do that. Um, you know, what, what, do you, what, do, what, do you, what do people think is a reasonable zero carbon target for the UK? It's currently 2050. Should it be earlier? And if so, how do we achieve that? Have you done this one? What? The time scale one. Um, well, I mean, time scale questions about building nuclear. Um, they are, yeah, they take time to build, but then they also last a long time. Um, and you get, um, I mean, it, you could build two gigawatts of nuclear at the same time as you can build two gigawatts of solar or two gigawatts of wind, to be honest, because you need an enormous number of solar panels and a lot of wind turbines. So I'm not, I'm not particularly um, worried about that because we need to do a, we need to have a huge build out program for all of the zero carbon options. And pe people are going to tire of having wind, wind farms. Onshore wind is really going to top out politically, I think. People, it's quite unpopular. I mean, it's popular generally, but it's unpopular when people have to see them. Um, <laughs> so, you know, pe people are, all, people are very, squeamish about having any kind of energy generation and who knows we might have a new kind of energy in by the end of the century fusion i don't know mm, might get fusion um estelle says there what can estelle what can i do as an individual <laughs> government to make policy change that's for you we've been talking too much so. okay um i really feel that um having conversations is is the really important starting point. I think that's why there's so much power in this event, actually, um, having intergenerational, intergenerational dialogues and having conversations with friends and um, even not friends, even people you just bump into as a good starting point because then you can really gather a lot more information on um, issues you may not have been aware of or um, other people's viewpoints, which you can then develop your own viewpoint to be able to like combat or um, and like in the end agree with their point. But um, also trying to get involved with um, local government and um, local like local policymakers and um, that kind of thing. I think is really beneficial, even if it is through letters and that kind of thing, because I think that. Um, the, the voice of many in the end will, is is quite powerful, despite the fact that you may feel like you're doing it on your own if you're just writing letters and that kind of thing. Yeah. Your turn. No, it's your turn. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly not in that case. I do. <clears throat> um, I think that you're right about the voice of um, many being, because people think that they're alone when they write a letter to the government, for example. But um, then if you for example, post that letter and then get loads of people telling you off about it. Um, but you also get a lot of people who see it as well. If you, I mean, if you just send it to the government, then only the government might see it, rarely. But um, if you post it online as well, then you get a wider audience as well. But um, it's not just, uh, it's not just about um, this, this one letter, it's about how many letters are actually coming in, you know? Mm. What's it? Rosa has a data in configuration, advisor, etc. Do you have any questions for Mark? Do I? I don't know. <laughs> so. mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah, do you think that you've influenced me? Like, uh, like, do you think that I only only ever choose your views, or do you think? Um, no, we, we disagree about lots of things. Um, for example, quite loudly. When you try to make me do the washing. Yeah, things, mostly household chores. Um, it's funny actually we don't really talk about environmental stuff in, you know uh, on a on a daily on a, basis do yeah. we no uh, I tried she hasn't read my book which I tried to get her to do I, I read the last chapter and that sums the whole thing up. I just skipped to the good bit yeah I did have a final point if we have a bit more time um you fled climate action because I know that um there actually has been some thoughts that I've read um, in different studies that ed environmental education alone doesn't create a lot of difference. But um, I think that hand in hand with encouragement of youth led action and the government really supporting youth in that, then a lot of 
difference can be made because as we can see there's already been so much action taken by youth um just based off of their own passions but if that's really mobilized and kind of used then i think that that can be even greater but i was i know that um even in at your young like amazing age rosa you've you've done and been quite active with the environment so i was, I was wondering what you thought of um you fled climate action and that kind of thing well i think it's a uh, really powerful especially because if you say this is my future i don't want you to mess it up for me um to the adults then um they can't say they can't say that um they don't care because we're their children you know they can't say that they don't care about their children and it's all about empathy and getting people to uh admit that they have been wrong which is hard to do because people get very defensive just by nature so it's um it's not it's not about blaming people it's about fixing it and uh, i think that you've led things do that a lot as well because um it's, it's when adults apologize that's great and all but it's not just about um saying that we need to blame everyone it's about making sure that we change the road that we're going on have we got another question? Mm. Youth dis disobedience can be harnessed to change government policies on climate change. Is that? Um, I definitely think that the passions of youth can definitely be harnessed um, to challenge and impact the government. Because I think that um, youth are very, very, they have a lot of potential which needs to be um, empowered and embraced. So yes, I guess I do. I don't really know what you mean by youth disobedience um, because I feel like youth, uh, they're in that stage of like growing and discovering and that kind of thing. But I definitely think that youth can be empowered and embraced to be able to create, um, oh, like, okay, Extinction Rebellion. Um, well, the school strikes maybe. Yeah, that was disobedience. Mm, you weren't allowed. Were you allowed to go off school? No. No, I mean the head teacher wasn't keen at all. Nope. So, it's not for me to say. I mean, I, well, I, I actually didn't want you to take too much time at school. I mean, no, school is didn't. a privilege. There's a lot of. I, I have quite. I don't know. Mixed yeah. feelings about it. I mean, the. I think what Greta Thunberg's done and the school strikes movement has been amazing. But at the same time, going to school is a privilege that a lot of um, kids in the world don't have. Or don't have easy access to um, and being educated and so on. So striking off school, yeah, you could do it you could do it for a bit, but that, you know. It's just like striking off your job, I suppose, except mm. with uh, bigger consequences for your future. Well, it's, it's consequences for your own future. Anyway. I mean, uh, when you strike off your job, your um, your uh, people who don't have that job might think, what are you doing? It's the same with school, I suppose. Mm. You know? I mean, some people don't have jobs mm. uh, and somebody strikes off their job, they could think, well, I don't, you have that privilege to be able to earn money, but um, wh why don't, why are you striking? But I think it's completely, um, I think it's completely necessary for a time with schools to get the attention and then to, um, then to lobby governments and things. So as soon as you have the media attention, that's when you can make the real change. And um, if you're not being listened to, you have to take drastic action. Like, uh, you don't, for example, nobody wants to, well, I don't think people want to cause damage to places, but um, other people take advantage of when people are doing peaceful protest and start being, and then start uh, looting and being horrible. Dad? Are you, uh, Mark, are you comfortable with the high long-term costs of dealing with nuclear waste? Uh, yes, I am. Explain. Oh, explain. Okay. Um, they, I mean, they, they shouldn't you don't the thing about nuclear waste that people forget is that it the longer you leave it alone the safer it gets until eventually it's completely safe um radi radiation has a half-life um depending on what it is and the, the the more highly radioactive something is the shorter the half-life and the quicker it becomes safe so in some ways radioactive waste is better than conventional <laughs> chemical toxic waste which has got maybe things like mercury and you know cadmium and things like that which remain toxic for all time so i think it's it's a non-issue um you know can can anyone think of anyone who's been harmed by nuclear waste ever i can't i mean and, and the legacy waste is not being is not being well 
it's a problem we should never have come about and which won't happen again in the same way, but there's lots of bad things we should have done in the 1950s, which we're still dealing with. Um, and I, I really wanted to start by raising the question or, or um, thinking around the fact that lots of people assume that the UN should be doing this or doing that, but actually the UN isn't a global government at all. Um, it's sort of a civil service directed by 193 member states. Um, and whatever it decides, or the 193 members decide, then for anything really to happen, um, it has to go through a process of each member state ratifying um, what the UN is suggesting. Yeah. So I wanted to ask, but start by asking how vital do you think you this international body actually is to, to direct, though not drive, action? Um, or should should it be supplemented by something else or something more? Jonathan. Um, <laughs> if we didn't have the UN, we'd have to invent it. If we didn't have these clunky processes like the um, UN, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, we'd have to in pass one. If we didn't have something on biodiversity, we'd have to make it happen. So I get a little bit grumpy about people who say we really don't need the UN. We need it, but it does not do everything that it should do. And that's because of the political structures of the UN, as you know extremely well. I'm sure you both know extremely yeah. well. And that means we have to go beyond and round the UN in many instances. For me, the most successful example of international solidarity uh, uncomfortable to think thing to say here in the UK has been the EU and the EU has always made it very clear that in order to get agreement between the 27 26 nations we would all have to give up some of our sovereignty we would just have to agree that to get really effective impactful decisions across a huge block 500 million people we would have to give up some of our sovereignty to make those big things happen. We can do that in the, well, we could do it in the EU. We'll never be able to do it again. Very difficult to do that at the UN because there's no such agreement because of the way the Security Council works, which essentially blocks pretty much every sensible thing that ought to be happening. What do you think, Lauren? Well, I think, I think that the structure of the UN has massive implications on what it can do and what it can't do. And I think that um, I, I, I agree with Jonathan that I think it is frustrating when people say we don't need the UN or uh, we should do the UN should be doing better because, yes, the UN should be doing better in lots of ways. But we need to acknowledge the fact that. Um, for all of the member states to interact, for us to have NGOs, for us to have the system that we do have is a good thing. But that's not to say that it's at its optimum level. So in terms of um, dealing with the climate and ecological crisis, I think that uh, more cohesion is needed within the structure of the UN. I think that member states need to uh, uh, be prepared to be pushed in a non-political way. And what I mean by that is, I think a lot of global leaders at the moment um, and historically have acted in ways that, where, in which they've only responded to issues when they feel there is political pressure on them. So first of all, I think the UN uh, could be involved in putting that political pressure on in terms of um, its ability to shape the involvement of member states. But I also think that the UN is incredibly important in terms of mobilising conversations. So for me personally, 
reason I think we need to utilize the UN's power in um, bringing forward conversations and in getting the ball rolling on starting to create cohesion between member states. Mm. Yeah, I, mean, I, I tend to agree, but when we look at the ecological crisis, and Jonathan knows this better than I do, but we've both been around while our hair has grown sparser and greyer. <laughs> uh, um, you know, going back to 1972, um, I first got involved in talking about climate change in 1986. Um, Jonathan, I think was a little before me um, and this agenda has been there and has been talked about by activists by NGOs a little bit by governments um, we signed up to lots of things in 1992 um, we've signed up to things since but while there has been progress I think the question is why are we still floundering about in the dark in a lot of ways when we actually have many of the solutions to hand? I don't know what you feel about that. What do you mean by many of the solutions? Well, I, I, you know, I actually think we know how to decarbonize much of the world. Yeah, um, we know what we need to do to preserve biodiversity, but. Um, when it actually comes to doing it, we're still floundering around in the dark. So what's stopping us, do you think? Perhaps Jonathan would like to comment on that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he's probably more dented by it than I am. <laughs> well, I, I joined the Green Party in 1974, so there are a lot of dents along the way, that's for sure. <laughs> um, I, I think mean, what's really interesting here is the is, is the different generational perspectives on this because i think it must be very frustrating particularly for people who care about international solidarity who want to see international brokerage to make things better for people across the world but to a certain extent our generations we didn't have any mechanism for circumventing the paralysis at the UN. There wasn't really a way of doing it. It either went through the UN or it didn't. And and it was all of you. So many things just got stuck, as you know, but stuck, yeah. stuck, stuck. I don't I don't feel that so much with young people today. And I feel there's a different kind of solidarity emerging. It's based on the same values. It's based very much on the notion that what affects one person anywhere in the world has a an a begin to emerge. And my sense is that when I feel the next wave of campaigning begins to grow and grow over the course of the next five years. The international element to it will be astonishing and it'll be a kind of United Nations without the United Nations. I don't, and I'm not dissing the, I'm not dis, dissing the UN, yeah. I'm really yeah. not. Mm -hmm. But what we will see is a kind of grassroots United, United people in their nations, let's put it like that. Do you mean sort of bottom up, top down leadership? Absolutely. I mean, but, I mean, do you but do you see also a role in this for, let's say, I mean, for example, that the most powerful NGOs in the world, the world's faith, who over the years I've been working in this, I have felt haven't played the part they really ought to have done and could have done. Mm. What do you think about that, Lauren? I think so. Well, as a discussion on interfaith, if that's is that what you're asking? Well, it, it's not so much a, a, a discussion of interfaith. It's much more in in my head. Mm. All the world's faiths, somewhere along the line, have a a creation myth and um, set of values about looking after the world, mm. um, and there should be a, a proselytization role that they can play or, or an activist mm. role in, in moving, perhaps moving um, society forward, <laughs> because that's what they do, um, and, and thereby aiding the, the movement that Jonathan was, was alluding to, and I know that you're interested in. Yeah, I mean, so... 
I guess you can call it dominion, you can call it sort of uh, a holy duty, you can call it all of these different things. But I think at the end of the day, it comes down to the fact that we are all human and that we are do all have a desire to survive. Um, and so I think that, yeah, I absolutely agree that the faith communities could be doing more and should be doing more. But I don't think that that just extends to faith communities. And I don't think that it's right for us to put pressures on one specific community because we all need to take account for the crisis that is ongoing and we all need to take action now as a christian myself as the daughter of a pastor i think it's so important that faith as such a strong community plays a part in that um but as an international issue of interfaith i think um i think that we need to ensure that in asking communities of faith to step up and to take action um we aren't leaving behind a different level of um a different level of targeting one specific community so i think yeah. you're both talking about more people becoming involved mm. how, how, how do you see that happening lauren well, for me, I think the UN has to focus on citizen engagement. And I know that's been a question for years and years and years. And for me, the answer to that is accessing and is, mo is mobilizing digital and, and mobile technology, is utilizing the evolving technology that we have to create a digital or mobile UN. Um, for me, that's something that I think looking into is absolutely invaluable in so many ways um especially in creating a conversation surrounding these issues mm. yeah I, it's, I, it's it is a really fascinating thing this question of numbers and how we get to the point of critical mass mm. <laughs> to a certain extent we're still not at critical mass let's be honest if we were we wouldn't be we wouldn't be here yeah, yeah. this evening still right. sounding a tiny bit desperate we'd be things <laughs> yeah. would be happening very differently so critical mass it does really intrigue me and i don't want to go back over old ground because i think you answered that really well lauren but the question about faith groups it's not i i don't think it's a question of uniquely targeting them above other mm -hmm. groups i think it is a question of unleashing the potential yeah. in people of faith to make that faith more militant i'm going to use that word which of course is there in um christian in tradition yeah. Yeah. is that we need to see that much more militantly expressed in their lives because what we're doing to the planet is in to, to use the the i hope the not inappropriate language is sacrilege mm, exactly and basically it is a destruction of god's earth from a christian point of view so i'm no great defender of catholicism by the way i think tons of things have been done in the name of catholicism which make me ugh, pretty um pretty uneasy but the pope i have to tell you the pope sort of gets his gets his wording right all the time and i love the fact that we've got a pope now who thinks that ecocide so killing nature yeah. should be a sin which would mean that every individual catholic who was guilty of ecocidal behavior would then be a sinner in the eyes of god now that's what i mean by militancy okay okay because i, I I think that there's a danger that we confuse religion and faith because True. faith and religion need to not be used as interchangeable True. words. Um, and if we absolutely focus on ecocide, I mean, also the Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, has been vocal about the climate and ecological crisis. Um, perhaps not as much, the church hasn't done as much as it should have, but um, I think yeah utilizing tight-knit communities like faith communities is yeah. absolutely a way forward right and that, now i mean do you also feel i mean i've we have to end up at the end of our 40 minutes with five ideas um mm -hmm. and i i just in preparing for this was sort of wondering mm -hmm. whether we felt we should should split out some of the issues that that action is needed on mm. um you know now um and i sort of started with with thinking about population per se and i know there's always this argument between consumption and population but in the end they end up in the same place in my view um and and is this something that at a global level 
one can address, do you think, or is this something that is, is too taboo? And because it's absolutely vital, in my view, um, you're laughing, Jonathan. <laughs> Yeah, well, I've got to laugh as the uh, president of a, an organization called Population Matters um, and yes. someone who's been banging on about population since 1974. Um, it is still taboo. You're right, Barton. It's ridiculous mm -hmm. that it's taboo. It shouldn't be at all. Of course, we ought to be able to talk about population, particularly when you think about what we need to do, which is essentially non-coercive, compassionate, just family planning. That's Absolutely. actually what it boils down to. It's a women's rights issue, essentially 270 million women who do not at the moment have the ability to manage their own fertility so even if we if we just started there and said okay what we're going to do is sort out education for girls so they can stay in school longer reproductive health rights access to contraception we're going to do these things that we take for granted in our most of our countries and that's going to make a really important contribution not just around emissions of greenhouse gases but it's going to make a massive difference to women's health, a massive difference to their ability to do what they aspire to do in their own communities and so on and so forth. So the fact this is a taboo subject still, I, I, you know, it just completely baffles me why a lot of greenies, a lot of environmentalists won't talk about it for fear of being accused of being some kind of sub-fascist zealot. <laughs> I think... I think for me, the reason why it's a taboo, it's a taboo subject is because historically women's rights have, and reproductive rights have been oppressed. And so I think you talk about controlling population and people immediately yeah, sort of start to worry about things like, you know, the uh, Chinese one child uh, policy. People worry about these things. And I think that it's not necessarily a logical reaction, but an emotional reaction to um, the idea of controlling women's bodies, the idea of controlling um, reproductive rights. I think that's that's where people that's where the taboo comes from. I think to move that towards an environmental conversation is absolutely necessary. Um, but again, I think it's a conversation that because people aren't having, people are unaware of the fact that um, that it's related to the to the climate and ecological crisis so inherently. And so I think that having the conversation is absolutely important, but we need to make sure that we go about it in a way that's actually positive and not going to scare people yeah. off. <laughs> that's can, I, can I just ask, Lauren, you know, I mean, you're, you're A, female, and B... That I am. <laughs> cool. So is any of this touched on in your, in your um, PSR lessons. I don't know what it's called any longer. <laughs> I um, mean, I feel like for me, it grows by an initial every single year. I take <laughs> yeah. um, so it but, will be learned by the whole alphabet. But, um, but I mean, you know, are you, is it discussed what size of family you might want to have? Um, no, not at all. So maybe yeah. that's an area for education that we yeah. could be thinking about. Absolutely. Yeah. I think uh, so much of this boils down to education and the way that we go about having these conversations. Um, and it just needs to become more of a part of the global conversation. And for me, the way we go about that is through grassroots projects, is through a digital UN, is through NGOs that are having these conversations on the grounds because they affect real life people, not just, um, you know, those at the top who get to hear the 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 policies and etc mm. but um, much as i'm loving this conversation mm. are there 41 other people in this breakout group and if so are, are we tracking what questions they're asking well because... I'm, i am i am watching yeah you are okay um yeah um what what is being asked yeah um uh, i mean in fact there was there was um something being asked it's something from i think glenn um there's a question here about population yeah i right you've seen that what does it say uh on population <laughs> what about the empty planet concept and i'm afraid that stunned me jonathan you know <laughs> Not something i'm familiar with jonathan um yeah it, do you want, could you give a brief explanation for those of us who aren't in the know? Um, well, 
There are various extremes of the view about overpopulation, as it were. And historically, there have always been people who say that the problem is all to do with humankind. And actually, the planet would be a wonderful, wonderful place without any human beings on it at all. I have to say, I do find this argument not particularly helpful. Um, mm. I, I think that, in a way, wherever you go in the population discussion, as Lauren was saying, don't talk about things like population control. Don't open your mind up to extremist views. Don't let people sort of use these extremes. But there is a really interesting movement now called the birth strike movement, which is more yeah. and more young people, Something young else. women in particular, that, yeah. deciding that they feel it, it now is morally unacceptable to bring children into the world. And I, I see that as an astonishing critique of our generation that we're, that a lot of young people today have to go through that kind of agonizing mm. decision making process for themselves yeah. that that they don't feel this is right so and i i think that's what an empty planet yeah. process means um and for some people it means an empty womb mm. which is very sad i think it is very sad um, can, can who... i just move on slightly yeah um, and say the next thing I've written down is another relatively taboo subject um, in in politics. Again, we heard it today, um, which is this question of subsidies mm. on so many of the things that I think we would agree were environmental bads that I was talking about, um, which is sort of part of a whole stream then of other things. You know, it, we we are subsidising oil, we're subsidising fisheries, we're subsidising industrialised farming. Um, is that, you know, is, is, the, is there an essence at the international level to actually ban or um, at least vastly discourage subsidy paying by governments, you think? I mean... Financial action will always warrant some kind of response. And so in the short term, monetary policy, well, not monetary policy, but, but these fiscal policies, these subsidies that we see will always create a response. But I think um, in terms of a global response, I'm not sure that it's enough of a long term solution to rely on. I'm not sure, Jonathan, what you think about that. Yeah, I mean, it is a difficult one because... In a way, it's, it's sort of the first base that we have to get to is to stop using taxpayers' money to destroy the foundations of life on Earth. You'd sort of think at a time when we were all signing up to doing things in a rather more intelligent way, more compassionate, and so on, so you would go straight to that place that says, OK, well, let's, let's stop paying people to destroy mm. the soils on which we depend to fill the atmosphere with greenhouse gases. I, I'm sorry to say... Um, but as you know, year after year at G20 meetings or other gatherings of world leaders, they have a form of wording that says that we commit to ending our subsidies for fossil fuels within the course of the next five years. Mm -hmm. And there's a particular website, unfortunately, which I can't remember the name of now, which tracks these empty words mm -hmm. and the fact that there has been no collective international effort made to reduce let alone eliminate the use of subsidies for fossil fuels or indeed for intensive farming, which in many respects is even more criminal because that is literally destroying soil. And mm. if you destroy soil, then... Off we go. Uh, it, it <laughs> just, We're in big trouble. <laughs> we are yeah. in big trouble. And, and the thing that people haven't communicated, I feel, about soil is that it is a, also a carbon sink. Mm. Yeah, And that if you exactly. farm properly... Um, exactly. It, it, it helps. So you know, that's, it the exciting, helps. that's the exciting, that's the upside of this um, need to criminalize subsidies is to mm. say, okay, so governments have historically been prepared to use lots of taxpayers' money to encourage behavior of one kind or another amongst their farmers or industrialists or energy industries. Well, let's keep the sum of money and just transfer it to doing exactly the opposite. So don't take away all support for farmers because 
that's not going to win the farmer's vote, is it? No. But there isn't any reason why we shouldn't transfer that taxpayer's money to make it possible for farmers to maintain their soils, to protect yeah. biodiversity, to look after water, to do all the things that actually, from my experience, most farmers really want, do what they want to do. do. Yeah. Really want to do. I, I mean, oh, go on, Bart. Go on. I was going to say that absolutely the key to this is considering both sides of the argument, is considering what we lose if we take away subsidies. And at the end of the day, that's rewards for the people who are working in these industries. And we need to consider the lives of those people. And we also need to consider um, the impact that that has on sort of mm. the down, the down, uh, downwards slope of that. But I guess what I'm trying to say is that if we want to move away from these things that are being subsidised, perhaps wrongly, we need to incentivise people who are working in those industries to refine what it is they're doing and to redefine that in uh, environmental context. And I think that that, for me, means looking into the green economy. Absolutely. OK, so so I mean, I, I, I sort of agree with this. So in, in doing that, um, at all sorts of levels. How does one start to engage with the corporations that very often drive the wrong way? Um, I mean, Jonathan, you have some experience of working with, with business. Um, I mean, I feel at the moment that, that, you know, in some ways, the nation state is now being subsumed by the global corporation that is not accountable in any governance meaning of the word. Um, so do you feel we should try and bring them within the fold, as it were? Um, or do you feel that we have to take more punitive action against them? I noticed today that the US government has decided to bring a lawsuit against Google for yeah. monopoly behavior. And that is the first formal step in a long drawn out process to break up the IT giants, which will have to happen. Their power now is is staggering. And as you said, but completely unaccountable power, basically. And we mm -hmm. don't really know how to legislate to do it better. We've have to, we have to find ways of breaking them up. So with certain sectors, we need to be aware of the damage that those companies are doing. But I am nervous about demonizing business and, and pointing the finger of blame at them. They, by and large, the big multinationals sort of follow the rules that are set by governments. The global economy, the rules of the global economy are set by governments, the IMF, the World Bank and the UN. I'm sorry, that's sort of basically mm -hmm. how it works. And most companies, apart from the out and out, lawbreakers and criminals and everybody else, and there are quite a lot of them too, but most companies want to operate within that framework. They, they, they try to make the best job. That's why we have things like corporate social responsibility and corporate sustainability, all this kind of stuff, which means they're trying to do their best within the rules of the game, but the rules are the problem. The rules so, are the problem. Yeah. So we're saying it's a policy shortfalling because, you know, it's exactly. a very well-known statistic that it's 100 of the top corporations that are responsible for 70% of emissions. I mean, it's a statistic that is quoted in so many different ways and, and often taken out of context. But I think um, that can't, all of the blame, we, we do have to move towards corporate change, but all of the blame can't be put on the corporations because at the end of the day, if they're following the rules implemented by governmental structures, then that isn't a shortfalling from their part necessarily, but a shortfalling from those who are implementing policy. Mm -hmm. So, so it, it, you, feel, you both feel it's a question of tightening the rules under which they operate rather than bringing them into the conversation? They should definitely be brought into the conversation, but in the context of where are we going wrong and what can be done to limit that. And yeah, it, we had, I think we had a reference, didn't we, earlier on to the idea of carbon taxing. Yes. Well, you know, if we had a carbon tax of $100 a tonne, the behavior of pretty much every company on earth would start changing very yeah. radically indeed. And energy efficiency would become the driver of business behavior, 
shareholders would be utterly incensed if companies were paying out huge amounts of carbon taxes every year because they couldn't get their act together on energy efficiency. But the, the companies can't set a carbon tax. <laughs> no, 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 I mean, that I'm, I'm reminded of, of the former head of UNEP, who was minister in Germany, who used to talk about the, the legislation was to create bottlenecks. And once you created the bottlenecks, the, the companies would solve the problem. You couldn't actually tell them what to do, but you created bottlenecks so that they became creative on the other side of it. Just not to rush us, but we have only got sort of seven minutes left. Right. Um, <laughs> do you want to talk a little bit about citizens' assemblies? Because I know that's one of your, uh, how we incorporate these into the international world. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think in terms of the crisis that we are all facing, Citizens' Assembly is absolutely a step in the right direction, calling for five Citizens' Assemblies, International Citizens' Assemblies, um, run and author authorised by the UN, I think is almost vital because we need to create some sort of, um, we need to create some sort of enforceable change that he, that is mandated by the people um, and I think that doing this in a, on a digital platform doing this where the question is ex thought about extensively and where people are given all of the information available to them um, I think is essential. What, Lauren what did you think of the, um, the uh, our climate assembly obviously it was a bit difficult because of COVID-19 but when you I don't know if you had a chance to look at the report did you did you think that was a success? No, to be honest, I thought it didn't go far enough because um, there is nothing to say that the, that the government um, will follow these points made. It's not in any way been sort of previously discussed or publicised what will be done with this information, what will be done with um, the outcome of this citizens' assembly. I think it was, you know, it showed us that we people can reach a consensus, people can, we can produce a report from a citizens' assembly, but it went nowhere near far enough in terms of showing what can be done with that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what did you feel about, I mean, having done this, Jonathan, I mean, do you feel it has to be mandated that, you know, rather like the Irish government did, that it would accept whatever the assembly said? Yeah, I mean, I think Extinction Rebellion were right to be a, a little bit cross about the way the Citizens' Assembly was set up. I mean, something that's set up by parliamentary committees without the government being involved in it is never going to really work. In France, of course, it was very much the opposite. And President Macron, because of Légis des Jaunes, President Macron pretty much undertook to deliver most of their recommendations, including, by the way, a referendum in France mm -hmm. within a year on whether or not ecocide should, should become a crime mm. in France, which is, I mean, to organize a national referendum around ecocide becoming a crime, that's, that's a pretty big thing, you know. Yeah. Just on this question here, it says, um, would this not be an action for the national level with state representatives putting forward stakeholders? Yeah. yeah. Uh, completely, I think it, it's interlinked to both. Um, but I think that the reason why it becomes national is because at the end of the day, we are all response, every single individual country uh, needs to be held to account for its contributions to the climate and ecological emergency. But particularly, I think this is of uh, international importance, because um, I think it needs to be sort of uh, collect collectively instituted in a way where we create um a level of uh, a level of cohesion between the responses to a citizens yeah. assembly so so you would see really the the un at the top of the pyramid of citizens assemblies setting yeah. setting the, the absolutely and then i think it it, it, it starts with, uh, i think no i don't even think it starts with the un i think it comes back to the un because i think that the un has the ability to mobilize the um these citizens assemblies but i think it needs to be done on local areas further down and then split into people from different different regions being a part of the citizens assembly right. because at the end of the day we need to give a voice to the voiceless um who aren't being heard in this in this crisis and lastly, because we've got to make a little list in a minute, mm. um, 
Jonathan, you're very strong on, on the coming of the wave of um, rebellion. Um, you, you feel this is about, the wave of rebellion is about hitters and that this is a good thing in terms of what we're talking about. I do feel that very strongly because when I look at the gap that exists between what the science tells us, which is very, very clear, and what the political response is, which is very muddled and inadequate. If I look at that gap, so the thing for me is the gap, I know that the only way we're going to narrow that gap is if we have every conceivable kind of pressure brought to bear on our politicians, including extra parliamentary pressure, including civil disobedience, including nonviolent direct action. And I think that what young people did by the end of 2019, it's you know, we've kind of forgotten a lot of it already in 2020, but by the end of 2019, there's 7 million young people out on the streets of their towns and cities saying, that's enough, we've got to do this differently. For me, that was just the most astonishing moment in climate-related politics mm -hmm. that I can remember. So I think we need that times a thousand. I think some of the other groups are ready to come back in with their um, points. So could we finalise our points? Right. <laughs> More rebellion. No, more rebellion. So, so uh, with, I mean, I think a digital UN assembly is one of our things, um, leading through to more citizens' assemblies uh, around the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. As Jonathan says, more citizen action, rebellion to make things happen. And I think the decriminalisation of a certain degree of, the, of that, uh, I mean, obviously we don't have time to go into it, but um, in a lot of countries, the response to that needs to be dealt with by the UN. Yeah. And, and lastly, would I you know, say that the fourth one is, um, we've only got four, but they're quite big ones, um, to make ecocide an international crime. I mean, I would argue that something that is really important to me is education on uh, reproductive health. Um, right. uh, I think that 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 is absolutely essential in terms of dealing with this crisis. Um, and I think that that requires an international response because there are a lot of countries where that is a lot more taboo than it is here. Um, and so I think that in terms of leading the way, um, we don't we can't we can't be seeing it as an us and them issue. It needs to be. Uh, and all of uh, a we issue, yeah, all of us together. I go with that. And, and ecocide as a as an international crime. Have we got another one. I thought you just used up for. <laughs> no, no, I've got yeah, four. This would be the fifth. Oh, fine. Well, I think stop ecocide is a fantastic campaign, mm. um, and it will grow and grow. Yeah. Are we back? Yes. Thank you very much, Damien. Thank you all the hosts who helped uh, manage those breakout sessions. Uh, ours was extremely productive. Um, can I ask um, the first group, my group, to report back? Uh, Ella, can you go? Can you bring her onto the stage? And there we go. Ella, what happened in our group? Hello, we had some fantastic ideas and questions about how we can tackle um, these issues on a community scale. Um, I think one of the, the main things we thought about was being able to change the values and lifestyles of those so close around us. Um, and one of the popular ideas that came up was definitely more education in schools, workshops in schools, and particularly enabling um, young people to take control and take responsibility and feel like they're involved in doing something and then for them to also be able to live those workshops within within their school or assemblies. Um, another key thing as well in terms of cha actually changing people's values and how we can do that, I think for me and my research, um, one of the best ways to do it is through political theatre and political art. And that's something that we can do on a community scale in terms of encouraging more um, community theatre, uh, especially in schools as well. If we're talking about um, bringing this into schools and educating children and young uh, and young adults, 
bringing workshops, drama workshops, political theatre workshop into those schools is just the perfect way to allow um, young minds to develop their own ideas and their own values and understand and see things and, like you say, take that responsibility for it. And then as well, when we can perform it, put it on a stage to a full audience of people that have all these ideas and parts. Okay, well, Ella, you seem to have lost your connection there, um, but thank you for those two. Um, what I took away from it was this idea of uh, a local Green New Deal, which would be a sort of umbrella project, uh, like um, Rob Hopkins' Transition Towns, but looking beyond the um, uh, post-carbon economy that we need to build in every uh, local community and the sort of plastic-free great unwrappings at supermarkets and all those kinds of things, to a, a rather more um, um, all-embracing thing that would embrace local authorities' uh, planning laws so that we can have uh, similar sort of planning constraints on new buildings or planning encouragement that would uh, enforce, um, you know, every new home to have uh, ground source heat pumps and super insulation and, and that kind of thing. Um, also, uh, cycle tracks, um, transportation to be entirely on 100% zero carbon, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. That would be uh, uh, a really important thing. But also, um, schools being um, run by students' interests of their future uh, to ensure that the education about these critical issues that are going to impact their future lives uh, being in um, in their education curricula, because uh, that ain't going to happen at government level. Uh, governments don't seem to want any more green crap in the curricula. Uh, and all the young people on our panel tonight have learned, uh, as I say, in spite of school. So that needs to become more front and center in the educational curriculum. And locally, uh, students can demand that of their teachers and make sure that it's not just classroom education, but as one of our uh, questioners pointed out, action projects, uh, monitoring um, local wildlife, flora and fauna, etc., uh, the kinds of things that really embed these issues in young people's minds. Flora, finally from you. Hi. Um, yeah, so um, going back to um, just protecting local sites, um, halting biodiversity loss so we can retain what we already have. Um, uh, and, yeah, use of fertilizer and pesticides in um, farming, um, linking into farming, creating more agroforestry, um, planting trees so that we just have more of a natural environment um, and at community level in Cambridgeshire we're actually starting from like quite a low low base um, we could definitely have more um, wild and natural land um, and then thinking about business as well um, so local businesses um, making sure that they're supported um, but then larger businesses that might have stores nearby um, such as IKEA has actually committed to net zero carbon by 2030 and um, I think it's really important that business take the lead um, yeah and that's that was this idea that came up in the questions of a kite mark for local businesses that uh, were eco-friendly let's go to um, Karen's uh, group Karen can you report back not immediately um but I see you sitting there all ready to go. So can you and Lauren and Jonathan tell us what happened in your group? Well, I, 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 I thoroughly had a really stimulating discussion. And I wonder if Karen, um, Lauren would like to start talking about um, citizens' assemblies, which we seem to feel was, were very important at the UN level. Yes, yeah, so um, in our conversation, we spoke about the need for uh, giving voices to those who previously haven't had any um, uh, in terms of the discussion on the climate crisis. I think that the, the consensus that we, we uh, got to was that there is a need for International Citizens Assembly that works in a structure uh, le that's led by the UN, but that isn't, isn't, uh, doesn't end at that that reaches down uh, into local communities, into regions, into continents, um, and to give a voice to those communities. So we would ask for uh, the UN to commission a series of citizens' assemblies. Yeah. Um, 
And um, another issue that, that came out quite strongly from what we were talking about was the um, issue of reproductive health and, and access to contraceptive services because of the population issue. Um, and this is something that um, in many ways has been a taboo, but um, we felt that this is something that definitely should be dealt with and encouraged and used through education at the um, international level. Yeah. Um, perhaps Jonathan would like to say something about about the, the wave of action that is necessary and that he coming thanks Bart. um yeah it's easy for me to say since i'm mostly forecasting that a lot of the civil disobedience that will be required to get politicians to step up and do what they need to do is likely to involve young people and i pointed back to 2019 when we saw exactly the power of that new energy in the whole climate debate but I think there's a question of intergenerational justice here. And what I love about the way this whole event has been structured is to say that young and old have to work in solidarity to make this kind of political pressure really work. For every young person taking part in the protests that we're going to see over the course of the next X years, there ought to be a, a grandparent with that young person, not necessarily in the same space, okay, but just there to be sharing in that um, campaigning uh, mission. Thank you very much, um, Jonathan. One, one, one more point, David, if I may, <laughs> which was interesting that it came up, it kept recurring, which is a, a thought that we should be looking more, much more carefully at the um, issue of ecocide and possibly criminalizing it at an international level. Yeah, I mean, the Pope has spoken out about this. Um, President Macron has put, spoken out about this. Um, and I think that um, we felt this was something that could come from the top down um, as a recommendation. Okay, that, that uh, is very interesting. Um, we all live in uh, memory of Polly and uh, that whole ecocide movement, and it's it's a fabulous British initiative which uh, lives on and is very powerful. So thank you for for raising it. I think it's really important. Um, okay, can we uh, then go to Mark and Estelle? I see you both back on the screen, and uh, let's hear uh, what national policy ideas you came up with. Rosa, do you want to go first? Yeah, sure. Well, we talked a lot about rewilding and um, and food production with the empathy links between um, baby animals and the things there that people, when they see a calf, they don't want to eat it. But when they see a full-grown cow, they'll eat it in a heartbeat. Um, and, uh, and how we need to um, change uh, our landscapes back to um, uh, pop repopulate it with uh, biodiversity and um, a lot more trees and uh, letting nature kind of replant itself back into our world. Mark, what, what, did, what um, um, did you impress you? Well, I mean, the, the benefit of operating at the national scale is that you can actually uh, mandate policy change. Which you can't do so easily at the national, at the local state scale, even or or at the international scale. I mean, it's very difficult to get countries to do things they don't want to do. It, whereas in, in communities, you can't change, you know, uh, what kinds of technologies people use because those things are driven much more by national mandates. So, for example, I think we should get diesel and petrol cars off the road earlier rather than later. Um, I think the government's talking about 2035. I mean, that should come forward by a decade. It should be 2025. Um, that's not something you can do in a community. It's not something you can do at the UN. It's actually something that has to be agreed um, in Westminster and by the devolved governments of um, Wales, Scotland, and Northern Ireland as well. So, you know, these things, but, uh, you know, it came out that it requires, these things require democra democratic consent. And, you know, you, you don't want to have such such ambitious 
policies which appeal to climate people, but we're still really a minority. But then you find that you've lost power and you've got a kind of Donald Trump type government which doesn't even believe in climate change. So you have to try and figure out ways really that you can keep political momentum uh, uh, nationally so that whatever policies you think are really going to work can, can be there in the longer term. We can actually, you know, we need to think, we've got to think decades out there, not just, not just the term of the next partner. Thank you very much. Um, okay, do we have uh, Karen and or, um, oh, I see Abigail's back. Uh, so, oh, Karen, and you are back. Thank you. So tell us about your creativity and what happened. Um, we had a very lively discussion. We had the um, young activists who do repeat anthology on with us as guests and talked about their process of coming to um, learning about heat and uh, its role in carbon emissions and the way they approached the subject, which was to create a beautiful anthology magazine with the voices of scientists and artists and teachers and gallery directors intergenerationally um, and why they chose that approach um, to get people engaged with the issue in a way they couldn't through, say, a policy paper. And they're hoping that MEPs will be reading it so that um, that the government won't be subsidizing um, using peatlands for agriculture and looking for other solutions. But uh, I think Abigail is joining me, yeah? Yes, yeah. she's here. There she is. Okay, I see you. Um, yeah, Abigail. And we also had another special guest, Colleen Flanagan, who is an artist who creates metal sculptures uh, that get installed in marine areas to help restore coral ecosystems. And she's also here in the audience with us. So we have a, a really nice discussion about creativity and conservation, why creativity and art are important, how it can be used, what role it plays. Um, and yeah, it was just a really fun and colorful and exciting conversation. We are running close to being out of time, but Abigail, do you have anything, because I'm not someone who uh, feels that rules are there to be broken, so if we go longer, we go longer. Abigail, do, do tell me what impressed you from your breakout session. Um, so I think from the breakout session, it's really clear that we need to use creativity, not only like individually, but um, in groups, we need to really inspire each other and like pledge to um, share initiatives and ideas that we see and really encourage others to you know look at things out there and think it is a problem how can we solve it maybe not not rely on people but just think ourselves what can we do and be more like enthusiastic um towards solving our own issues and also like appreciate the resources we have at hand be creative with what you've got um so you know if you've got old curtains make yourself a face mask you know and um, things like that just be creative with what you've got Thank you very much. Okay, so um, you need to get into the questions. Um, we have about 60, 65 people um, still with us um, uh, who made it back uh, to the plenary, which I really congratulate you on because I almost didn't. I don't know how I got back here, but I did. <laughs> so we're looking to all of you to upvote um, the, um, the priorities and the actions. Now, we, the... Um, uh, panelists can't upvote anything, I don't think. You just click on that little thumbs up and it, it all goes uh, piling upwards. And the things that uh, you feel are most important will rise to the top. So um, do get into those questions. And meanwhile, I'm going to ask each of the panelists to just give a final word about where they would like to see us um, focus our attention and priorities uh, going forward. And... Um, yeah, uh, let's start with uh, Mark and Rosa. What have you learned most from this evening and what would you like to see us focus on going forward? Just uh, in a couple of words from each of you. Thank you. Actually, can, can we hand the mic to Estelle who didn't um, yet report back from our workshop and maybe she can share some thoughts as well? Estelle, are you uh, there? That's very sweet of you, Mark. Go for it. Uh, is Estelle with us? Estelle is our rapporteur, so she's going to be reporting back to the final conference on Saturday afternoon. But what have you learned from this evening, Estelle? Go. Hello. Sorry, my connection's a bit unstable. Um, I've learned a lot from this evening. Thank you so much. Um, one thing that I will really take away is, I think, the importance of education 
and of include trying to include education on the environment in the national curriculum and how it can really go hand in hand with youth-led climate action and I think there's great importance in the government trying to um, embrace and encourage youth-led climate action in a way which um, will create lots of value rather than um, any of the um, effects which may have seemed disruptive to some with rebellion. Okay, very good. You're a little bit, um, uh, yeah, your connection is not great. Uh, Mark and Rosa, can we come back to you for your final words? Let Dad go first, Mark. <laughs> what? <laughs> um, well, uh, I for one think that energy is a really important part, and taking diesel and petrol straight off the road is going to be massively important, as well uh, as air travel and everything. And I know we didn't talk about it much, but I know the fashion industry is quite um, quite a big contribution to a lot of emissions and stuff. We had a climate day at school after much lobbying, and uh, they we did uh, somebody came in and talked to us about fashion, and um, and we watched the whole documentary on it and things like that. So I think that it's um, also, that's also really important. Um, and how would you do that? I'll leave you with a plug from, on behalf of the Climate Vulnerable Forum. Uh, there's a countdown to midnight campaign to encourage countries around the world to submit their NDCs under the Paris Agreement. NDCs are the plans that they're supposed to produce to say what climate action they're going to take. Um, most countries of the world, the vast majority, haven't bothered. Uh, the clock is ticking, and midnight on the 31st of December, New Year's Eve, is when the clock runs out. So please put whatever pressure you can on governments around the world to submit submit their NDCs and uh, get back on track to the Paris goals. Great. Thank you very, very much. Um, now, I think I want to call on... Um, um, yeah, Bart, do you have any final words for us? Thank you, Mark and Roger. Well, I, I was um, deeply in, encouraged by tonight and, and the thought that everybody was putting into it. Um, and I was particularly interested in the response of um, Lauren and Jonathan to the question of population, which is something that I think is so often left out of this. And if going forward that message can be carried through this intergenerational forum, I, I would be very pleased. I don't know what, what Lauren, whether Lauren would actually add something. She almost certainly would, but so why don't we go to Lauren, uh, if you can. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> not fair. That's not fair. Funnily enough, you were correct. Um, yeah, I think just to take away that um, the climate crisis is uh, an issue of gender inequality, an issue of income inequality, um, something that we talked about in terms of reproductive rights. Um, we talked about in terms of population growth, but we know that the climate crisis disproportionately affects women and people of colour, like we were saying earlier. And so I think um, a focus on education in terms of uh, the fact that the climate crisis might not directly impact you currently, but it will be impacting other people. OK. Um, can we hear then from Karen what your final words to us all would be? Um, I think a theme that came up in both the main panel and the breakout was the importance of intergenerational dialogue. And I think that what we're doing here is a really great example of that. I've had a, a huge amount of fun with Abigail and, um, and the repeat uh, activists also said that it was a big part of what they were doing and why they created the anthology to bring in a diversity of voices. And so I think that there's a lot of hope that I got out of tonight's discussion. Thank you very much. Um, Abigail, it has to be you now. Tell us what your final thoughts are on this evening. Um, I think um, well, my final thoughts are that education is probably the biggest um, driver towards a green economy. I think without educating young people, um, you know, not enough will be done. And I think it's going to, you know, obviously pass down the kind of the burden of climate change will pass down to younger people. So I think it's so important that, you know, we're educated sufficiently and accurately as well. You know, there's lots of 
um, news going around that isn't necessarily accurate. So I think it's uh, adequate um, education is really important. Also, individual responsibility. So doing actions yourself that you can do, like lobbying your local MP and attending um, uh, protests and just being active in your own education. Very good. And Abby, you haven't actually told us about your, your wonderful own personal action about uh, fast fashion, but uh, you're looking at young people who are already taking action here, and I really thank you for that. Um, <clears throat> now, we've heard from, we haven't heard a final word from Ella. Let's hear a final word from Ella. What do you want to say? Hey, so I think the, the main thing for me is the um, change of push for a change of values and change of lifestyle and, all, and, and try and collect, connect us all on one level um, and feel like we have the responsibility to do something. So pushing for a change of values and leading to the understanding of the chaos that is already going on and allowing people to, to understand that and see that. And like Lauren said, even when it's not necessarily affecting them right now, for us to understand what is important right now and what's going on in every part of the world and why we need to change. Okay, so the last word comes to you, Jonathan. Um, what would you like to leave um, the audience thinking about? What I've heard tonight has been um, really inspiring <laughs> and it adds an extra dimension to the uh, Extinction Rebellion call for tell the truth because telling the truth is not just about facts or arguments or rational debate <laughs> telling the truth is what's happening in each of us and our and the values that we bring to bear on these very complicated concerns and i've really loved that deep values perspective that we've heard um this evening i guess the strongest message for me from all our young panelists is just a reminder is uh, <laughs> what's it going to take for us lot to be good ancestors basically because we're sure not there yet <laughs> 